701, I will call to order this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board on Monday, November 18th, 2024. The first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? Um, I move to approve the agenda as presented with the addition of a discussion of employee health insurance after the executive session. Do I have a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. The agenda is approved as amended. Next on the agenda is the consent agenda items, of which we have three. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda items as written. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Consent agenda is approved as written. Next is public uh, session. Anyone wishing to address anything not on the board agenda, I would ask to please come forward uh, and try to keep your remarks to three minutes. Anything requiring more discussion, we'd be glad to put it on the agenda for the next meeting. Skip, you have something. I don't need to come forward. I didn't come for this, but while I'm here, I just like to thank the select board for the recording in progress. For the pain yeah, hey, the breakfast and uh, all your help and assistance. Um, with the variety of hooks we had, we did introduce a variety of different styles of pain. <laughs> 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 Thanks to all the EFUD board members that all helped, too. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the historical uh, presentation on the origins of the uh, Staff Appreciation Day and uh, all the other discussion. I wasn't there for all of it, but uh, we appreciate everything that you did. I did forget one thing I had intended to cover, which was with the winter croquet trophy that we won it the last year that they had it and then they didn't want the trophy back so the historical society doesn't think it's the most decorative thing <laughs> <laughs> no um, they tried to give it back to wdd and they said they wouldn't take it either? Well, no, no rednecks on the historical <laughs> society. <laughs> so you, you can uh, invent some competition and start it on a new round of... Uh, mm. Winter water polo. <laughs> Winter water polo. <laughs> all right. Well, all are on the subject, unless you've got more to say on that. No? No, are they just... Did they use both bags of blueberries? Yes and no. Uh, Are you hungry? I understand both of them were opened, but there is, there is remaining frozen blueberries uh, and where they are right now. I'm sure they're still in the freezer. They're probably still in the freezer at uh, St. Louis. Oh, I'm curious. <laughs> Ready for this <laughs> year. So. Nope, that's it. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on that. Uh, I wanted to uh, may, uh, let everyone know that I have accepted a job offer from Vitalizing Waterbury to serve as their executive director starting January 6th. And therefore, to prevent any perceived or real conflicts of interest, I will be stepping down from my position as chair of the select board. Uh, fire before uh, January 1st, or the first meeting in January, uh, at which time we will have a new organizational meeting uh, to uh, elect officers so uh, I want to thank everyone for your uh, trust and confidence in me and uh, I've been happy to serve over the past two years and uh, you know, pledge to continue to uh, fulfill uh, my uh, tenure uh, on the board but not as an officer. Thank you, Roger, for yeah. all your service. Mm -hmm. We thank have a, appreciated your leadership. Well, thank you. Uh, another announcement, I um, 
met uh, with uh, members of the uh, Route 2 neighborhood uh, on the west side of town uh, this past Wednesday, I believe it was. Uh, and uh, we met with uh, the uh, state's attorney and uh, Lieutenant um, T.J. Howard uh, and came up with uh, some solutions to the uh, uh, drug situation that's happening out there um, and uh, plan to uh, follow up uh, with the state's attorney and uh, we will be putting that back on the agenda uh, at a meeting whether it'll be the second uh, or the first or second meeting in December. Uh, the yet, but I did want people to know that we are continuing to follow up on that. It's a situation of extreme concern uh, both for the town and for that neighborhood in particular. Any other issues that people would like to address on the public agenda? Hearing none, we will proceed. Next item is the uh, Agency of Natural Resources Worcester uh, Range Management Plan. We have a couple of guests uh, from ANR. Uh, I believe it's uh, Jim Duncan and Oliver Pearson. If you wouldn't mind uh, take a seat and introducing yourselves and uh, give us uh, what you can. I know it's a quite a voluminous document, but uh, if you've been able to pull out certain things of particular interest along the way, that would be great. Absolutely. Well, uh, thank you, Chair Select Board, for having us today. My name is Jim Duncan. I'm the State Lands Manager for the Division <coughs> of Forests at FPR, and I oversee the uh, five district stewardship foresters and the planning work that they do, so including the Berry District that produced the Worcester Range Plan. Good evening, uh, it's great to be here. My name is Oliver Pearson. I'm the Director for Forests with the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. My colleague, Becca Washburn, our Director of Lands Administration and Recreation, I hope to be here this evening. Unfortunately, she had a, a family event that prevented her from, from joining us, so I'm, I'm filling in. Um, in. My role as Director, I wasn't intimately involved in the development of the Worcester Range Management Unit long-range management plan, so Jim's going to do most of the um, speaking. I've also only been in the role for about a year, and I'm mostly here to listen to what concerns the select board has regarding the future management of the Worcester Range Management Unit under the, under the plan. Thank you both. Yes. Jim, why don't you go ahead, and then uh, okay. we'll break it open for questions among the board, and then we've got a couple of P, uh, chairs of uh, committees and other committees that are particularly interested. Um, so we'll give a quick overview of where we are today with the management unit um, plan and kind of how we've gotten to where we are. And uh, specifically, I've pulled out some information to uh, speak to some of the comments that were submitted by the Conservation Commission as well as the uh, Utility District and try and answer any questions you might have about those specific responses and changes made in response to that. Um, so where we are in the process, uh, just to recap, the Worcester Range represents 18,000 acres about of uh, state-owned land in five towns. Um, it's mostly owned by the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, although there are some parcels that are owned by uh, Fish and Wildlife as wildlife management areas. Um, the first stage of the plan was public scoping that was done right at the height of COVID. Um, so there was uh, online interaction that generated our first round of input. We also did a number of natural resource assessments and integrated that into our first draft of the plan, which was released last year. Um, we received 650 comments on that draft plan um, across a whole range of topics from recreation to water resources to uh, forestry. And the district stewardship team, which is our interdisciplinary team of wildlife biologists, ecologists, foresters, rec specialists, uh, historic resources specialists, looked at all the comments, grouped them into themes, and wrote about a 70-page response to the comments received that then became part of the plan. The other piece that we did was looked for any changes we needed to make to the plan based on something that we may have missed or some uh, desires of the public that could be integrated without um, un undermining any of the other values that were being managed for on this parcel. Um, so we did make a number of edits in response to those comments. None were considered so significant that they required our second round of input on a, a new draft of the plan, so we did advance that plan as a final plan. Um, agency leadership reviewed and approved that plan, and it was signed on September 
uh, at the end of September of this year. So now that we have this plan in place, we are uh, moving into the implementation phase. Um, but there was a lot of interest in this plan, and so it was great to have this opportunity to come to a body like this and at least talk about what had changed in the plan and any topics of interest we might have that we can try and answer. That said, it's a 394-page plan, and we are about two people. Um, we can do the best on certain topics, and if there's anything that you have questions on that we can't answer tonight, we'll obviously take those back to our colleagues and come back with answers as best we can. And the plan's envisioned to be in effect for 20 years, okay. so it covers yeah. roughly that period, um, at which point we would hopefully be you know, working on the next plan for the subsequent 20-year period and so on. So now that the plan is in place, we move into the implementation phase where we have a schedule of activities that are already outlined in the plan. There are certain topics that can be considered for additional proposals by, say, a recreation partner who has an interest. Um, but it provides a decision-making framework and a, a kind of a map for what we're going to do for the next 20 years on that process to manage for all sorts of values. Um, so just kind of to go through some of the changes that were made in the plan, um, they are uh, some of them are minor, some of them are more general, but uh, I've tried to pull out some of the ones that might be of interest to this community. Um, the major changes, the areas of change that we had were around recreation, some changes around forest management, uh, some of our land management classification, which is how we define different management levels, and then water resources. Within recreation, we added some language about uh, attempting to concentrate use within highly sensitive management areas are kind of the most um, the most protective area management classification we have in terms of management intervention. So trying to concentrate trail use in those high elevation and steep sloped areas and uh, assessing and addressing unauthorized trails, either through formalizing management or through closing them. So that's, that was made clearer in the document. We also uh, did add the ability to consider backcountry skiing proposals with a qualified recreation partner should that uh, arise um, for managing backcountry skiing if that was proposed. Um, there was a uh, language added to enable consideration of a connector trail from Perry Hill to Little River State Park that was in discussion with uh, some comments from WADA members. And then there were um, some more additions around the Brownsville Trails, Elmore Beach Mat, consideration of um, recreation and how timber sales are laid out for other uh, elements that we added, clarification or additional text to explain better. Within our land management classifications, I think one really important change that we made was uh, redesignating the Green Crow parcel from uh, what we've been calling a special protection area into a wildlife corridor designation. Um, which really represents its uh, unique position in the Sheetsville Wildlife Corridor framework and maintaining that wildlife habitat connectivity. So that was a, a good shift in designation to better represent the goals of that parcel. Um, and that was the only major land management classification change that we made that I think would address some of the comments we got in Waterbury. In our forest management realm, um, we did change the scheduling of some of the timber sales so that we were not uh, seeing sales or harvests being done in the same town over and over again and try to spread that out, out over time. We I improved the climate adaptation section and uh, really built a really strong um, uh, explanation of how active forest management and timber harvest as part of that can be used for climate resilience and addressing biodiversity and structural diversity needs in our forests um, and added a number of uh, clarifications around process for how timber harvests are conducted into the plan itself. And then finally in water resources, uh, the major changes are really around clarifying the uh, type of monitoring that's already being done and how that monitoring is chosen through tactical basin plans that are um, colleagues at the Department of Environmental Conservation overseas, so there's kind of a different planning process for those water resource monitoring methods. So it's mostly clarifications, additions of text that explain some of those pieces better. We did make a couple of changes to try and address some of the concerns that we've seen in public comment. Um, looking specifically at the two comments, I, when I was corresponding with you, Mr. Chair, we had uh, comments from the Utility District and from the Conservation Commission. Um, the Utility District, uh, I think had highlighted some good, uh, we had one miss in terms of an ownership statement that we fixed, um, which was helpful to get that clarification. Um, and we had uh, 
there was a concern about managing recreation and seeing that would have erosion of the surficial water quality man maintenance on that area. Um, the additional language around the uh, way that we'll manage or address unauthorized trail construction we find it was important for that. And I, our comment response um, included a commitment to collaborating on any future land use issues that should arise in that district that we that cross onto the state land boundaries. So that was an explicit um, commitment or in the comment response to, which is now part of the plan. So I think that was a good, um, helpful comment to get from the utility district. And I hope that we've made some good strides in representing that collaboration for you to manage those impacts. The other um, comment from the uh, Conservation Commission had uh, pointed out this, um, the representation of the Shootsville Wildlife Corridor, while very explicit in the assessment sections, didn't appear in the management sections. Um, and I was fortunate to be able to have a good conversation with the chair, who I believe is on, I'm assuming that's Amy and yes. 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 Hi, Amy. <laughs> so um, I was fortunate to be able to have a good conversation with Amy and um, learn more about the kind of history of that corridor and how it was represented here. And we talked about land management classifications, which is our way of designating certain areas based on the resource values. And so those land management classifications um, kind of bake in the wildlife connectivity as a key ecological function that's being protected by these highly sensitive management areas and special management areas in our plan. Um, so while it's not in the language of the management classification, it's the basis of those classifications and it's the goal that's explicitly managed for by those management classifications. So in the future, when we get requests for activities in those areas, we look at the management, the reasons that areas in that management classification, the strategies and the major goals, in this case, ecological function and biodiversity preservation, those will be the most important resources to protect. And if we can't maintain those with, alongside a proposal, that's gonna be harder to accommodate. So that's the, the main way that our management mapping on the parcel fits with that ecological function of wildlife connectivity. Um, and the, I mentioned the land management classification, uh, changing that from special protection to wildlife corridor explicitly also uh, adds that recognition for the important role the shoot still plays in making that connection from Mansfield to the Worcesters. Um, those are the, the remarks I had prepared. Um, like I said, I'd love to answer as many questions as we can, and um, they may be on these topics, and if they're on others, we can take them back if we can't answer them. So um, with that, that's all I have to say. Unless there's something you want to add all over. I would just back up and from a sort of a very macro perspective, looking at the entire Worcester Range Management Unit. This is contained in the plan, and it wasn't a big change from the draft to the final, but just for, for the purposes of this meeting, and Jim can correct me if I, if I misspeak, uh, I think just over 50% of the Worcester Range Management Unit is in highly sensitive management area classification. Mm -hmm. So what that means is, is just over 50% of the Worcester Range will not be subject to any sort of commercial vegetation management, timber sales, and the management objectives in, in that land will be for pr preservation and conservation of ecosystem functions, habitat, et cetera. And so I think that's part of our, our commitment to ensuring the sort of long-term viability of this extremely important forest ecosystem. You have maybe just under 40% in different types of management classifications, but not where there will be commercial timber sales. And then just under 10% of the Worcester Range is uh, designated for uh, timber sales over the next 20 years. And there's 12 different timber sales contained in the plan. So those will be rolled out you know, over the 20 year period and typically when you lay out a timber sale, there's parts of each sale, maybe an individual block is 140 acres, and there's parts of that block that you can't actually harvest timber from because of you know, sensitive areas, riparian areas, wetlands, etc. So I think it's important to note that no more than just under 10% of the Worcester Range will be subject to um, commercial vegetation management and timber sales over the next 20 years. And then finally, the, the silvicultural or forest management approaches that we use are not associated with clear cutting, not associated with removing all of the, the timber. There might be you know, patch cuts where we, on a three to five to seven acre basis, remove all of the timber, but we're essentially using, a, this is described in the plan, an uneven age management approach, which is trying to improve the structure and composition of the forest to make it more resilient to climate change. Uh, we'll also providing some habitat benefits and of course getting some timber out to market. 
So it's, I think, putting the, the entire plan in con sort of context, it's a huge commitment to conserving these ecosystems, to making sure that they're intact and viable for, for the foreseeable future, but also meeting our statutory objections to provide a multiple use approach to managing state lands and managing public resources on the state lands. And so that, I think it's just important to frame sort of the overall plan and how we divided it between these different mansion objectives uh, for the subway. Great. Thanks. <clears throat> thanks for that overview, and thanks, uh, Jim, for uh, addressing the particular issue that we brought to your attention. We really appreciate you, both of you coming tonight. Uh, let's open it up to the board and see your last question. Okay. I have a macro question, so this might fall to you, Oliver. Um, with the restrictions based on what you said, 80 to 90 percent of the ridge line, um, with those restrictions, do they exclude green energy projects? Is my I guess my first question, um, such as wind. Um, and my second question is, of course, with the with the logging and timber sales, um, taking into account uh, the last reason. One, one of the parts of Waterbury's last flood was runoff from the mountains um, <clears throat> and with the timber sales. Is there any way to avoid, as you said, you weren't going to be clear cutting, but in certain sections, a few acres here, a few acres there, how do you, uh, is there a plan to account for erosion? Sure, I can, I can address both of those. Um, the, the green energy or infrastructure development in those highly sensitive management areas would be directly counter to the sensitive nature of those sites, the access roads, the infrastructure that needs to go in to put in infrastructure um, just wouldn't be compatible with the reasons those are designated in general for what we call highly sensitive management areas. The other piece that's in play with Worcester Range is that there's a natural area that covers the top of the um, uh, the top of the ridge line, and that's a statutory designation that's been applied, and that would need to be removed before something like the green energy project would go in. So I would say it's it's not impossible, but it is extremely unlikely and probably pretty difficult, and not something that this plan would accommodate. Um, so it would take a lot of change. Right. Um, to the second question on the erosion concerns. Um, so we employ what are called the acceptable management practices for maintaining water quality on logging jobs on every job that we do, and not just the minimum requirement for no discharge to surfaces of the surface waters of the state, but all of the recommendations in terms of spacing of water bars, layout of roads, um, use of crossings. So the, the, and also we have what are called riparian management guidelines for a &R lands that set minimum buffer widths around riparian features, wetlands, um, and not just perennial streams, but intermittent streams as well. So we're already applying a lot of um, cutouts that keep any exposed sediment from those waterways. And then when they do, when there is movement, it's, it's slowed or stopped by the water bars, the culverts, and the, um, the uh, filter strips that are put in. So um, while the logging job is happening, there's very strict controls on any discharges that could happen. Um, and that's all covered in our contracts and requirements of the operator, and we shut down sales regularly if there's a need to address a water quality issue that's arising. Um, the other piece is that the amount of vegetation that's being removed is not enough to free it. It doesn't free up so much water that you see this accumulation down surface. And that superficial flow is really not appreciably higher for these small cuts. Um, some work that was done at Hubbardbrook Experimental Forest, look at what happened if you completely remove all the vegetation and apply herbicide to prevent anything from regrowing, you can see a signal. In these stands where we immediately have vegetation regrowth, mm -hmm. that vegetation regrowth starts picking that water back up after a year. So at the pace that we're doing harvesting and the smaller scale, as Oliver was saying, with uneven age management, we're just not achieving anything close to what you need to see to see that signal downstream from this unit. Thank you. And we did some modeling with our colleagues at BEC um, in response to some of the concerns that came up with a plan to look at what would it take for, um, or what would happen if we cut all these units at the same time, completely removed all the vegetation from all the acreage, and we still weren't seeing that signal um, at a level that would have made a difference in the bodies. Yeah, the, the, the acceptable management practices are robust enough that when applied properly, there will not be any discharge. And so the, the theory behind the AMPs is that when they're put in place, you won't see erosion and discharge into downstream receiving waters. And I think we have to, as a &R, we need to stay on top of that and adapt to the incredibly intense precipitation events that we've seen over the past two summers. And so that's something that 
that we're doing. But I think one of the benefits of timber sales on state land is, is we hold the, the logging contractors, as Jim said, to this very high standard. And if they're not complying with that standard, as Jim said, we'll, we'll cut and shut the sale down. So I think the concerns are, are valid that, that you have. I, I don't think that you would see any measurable impact in terms of flooding or erosion from the types of timber sales that we're doing on the Mr. Range that would affect the, the downstream municipal area. Thank you. Other questions? Mike? Uh, having worked on a lot of statewide management plans, uh, one concern that I do have, I, I like that you have identified that there's a certain percent of land that would be acceptable for civicultural practices. That's a good thing. But in some of the other plans that have been out there, a lot of the prescribed cuts never, never seem to happen. And I think the prescribed cuts are something good. Someone who is an avid conservationist, uh, early successional habitat is really important to, to wildlife when we're seeing less and less of early successional you know, habitat. Show, that shows in my uh, deer hunting uh, experiences last past weekend. But um, how, how could you, can, can you guarantee that it, it's a small amount that, that will, those cuts will happen? So the, um, yes, uh, well, can I guarantee that they will happen? They, they will happen because the reason they're prescribed is this, what right. is deemed uh, appropriate for forest management goals at a unit-wide scale. It's your point of creating early successional habitat, but also having forests in, very, forests in various ages of development. And um, we have a capacity issue that is at play as well. And we have two state lands foresters in this district who are doing sales in Worcester Range, they're doing harvests in Mount Mansfield, and because we apply a lot of controls on our harvest development, there's a lot of abuse and layout that has to happen. So um, it just takes time to develop a harvest. We have two years of flooding that take out state right. roads, and we just get pulled off of that work. So it's, it is hard to keep up with our um, vegetation implementation schedules, but in general, we are keeping up with them. Um, right. When we put these plans together, we have a, a list of years when those should be done, and um, we try and hit that within a couple of years. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit longer to get to a harvest because of flooding or however the um, issue progresses. Or you have a, another unit that's maybe reaching a stage where it wouldn't be appropriate to harvest again and you need to reevaluate it. So um, we do keep up on our harvest implementation schedule. It's um, not, at, I should say, we keep working on our harvest. We don't always keep the years that they're there, but those are right. ideal years. Because I know that sort of happened at Camel's Hump. And yeah, and it's taken a while to have the first harvest that we did have our first harvest begin last summer, right. last winter, I mean, and be in the second year this year, and we have another harvest that'll be hopefully beginning this winter or next winter. So we're starting to get into that plan too, but it's been a it's been a slow ramp back up from COVID. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we want to implement the plans as design. It's interesting, I would just add New Vermont conservation design calls for different amounts of, of different forest types, including you know, mature and old forest, right. but also young forest. And so we want to be able to contribute to meeting those BCD, the one conservation design targets for young forest in the Worcester Range through the implementation of those timber sales. Thank you. Any other questions? Just one, yeah, on the, on the recreation side of things, um, some really interesting pieces in this, in this plan um, on that front. I know through public comment, there was a lot of comment about recreation specifically. Um, I know after the release of this management plan, um, Stowe Trails Partnership, specifically probably through Vermont Mountain Bike Association, has made some specific recommendations. And I guess my question is about process. Um, you'd mentioned a, uh, you know, a connector between Perry Hill and Little River State Park. Um, and what is the, the process for you know, projects like those? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so the plan has kind of two levels of recreation proposal or recreation considerations. One is projects that we will do, um, maybe expanding the parking area or um, establishing a universally accessible trail, that the things that the agency is committed to doing on the parcel. So those proceed through what we call our annual stewardship plans. Um, okay. They'll be scheduled in and reviewed and then implemented um, and led by our district staff usually. 
Um, we always we have strong recreation partnerships with WADA, FIBA, Stoke Trail Partnership, so they assist us in managing and maintaining those assets when they're built. Um, but some of them we commit to building within the agency. And then there's a second um, layer of recreation project development, which is that our recreation partners can propose projects on state lands to fill a need that they're seeing. And if it's contemplated in the plan and compatible with the uses of the plan, it can be reviewed through what we call a recreation project review process. Mm -hmm. And that's a step where our recreation partner proposes a project. Our district stewardship team uh, looks at the initial kind of concept and says, yes, this is generally compatible with the plan. It's generally compatible with uh, the other values that are in that area. Please develop this proposal further. And then the recreation partner can go into more detail on management, like where they want the lines to be, what their management uh, for visitors is going to be, any seasonal considerations, the whole list of pieces that they put together and bring back to the district stewardship team, working with our recreation specialist to develop that proposal. Then it's fully reviewed by the district stewardship team from ecological perspectives, historic resources, all of the pieces that we consider, and if it's a good project and fits, fills an identified need and adds to the plan's goals for recreation, then we can proceed with implementation at that point. Okay. So it's kind of like an a, a in-between step, because then it goes it goes to our project review and then gets implemented. Yep. So the presence of those considerations and contemplations within the plan are a way to identify areas we already know we want to fill recreation gaps when there's an opportunity, and also identify those areas that maybe there's less compatibility with certain recreation use. Awesome. That's a great answer. Thank you. Yeah. One more. Um, we have in our town special ridgeline rules and stuff like that. Do you see any conflicts with Waterbury's ridgeline rules? And um, do we do we need to make any changes? Or I am not familiar with okay. ridgeline rules in Waterbury. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, I this is where I know. Becca is fairly familiar with uh, some of the uh, specific regulations, and she might be able to answer that. Um, I can certainly look into it and get back to you. Okay, great. Okay. Thanks. Well, no, I was just going to say, for context, the intent is to make it more restrictive to do additional development at yeah. set, right. set yeah. level. So there's, there's no conflict. <laughs> That's our question, <laughs> <first> chair. <laughs> so. so it might be a fairly easy comparison to see right. if yeah. I, I think it would. Yeah. Yeah. I would hope, if anything, that they would be complimentary. Okay. <laughs> so we can look into that and get back to you. Yeah. Make sure. Okay. Uh, got uh, questions from the board. Now let's move on to the, some of the other committee members here. Yeah, we've got uh, Martha from the planning commission. Yeah, I think Martha's got chair of the planning commission. I actually want to follow on Ian's uh, question. Martha, can you have words with the people that are giving you that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just want to follow on Ian's, I think, question. I didn't quite hear all of what you said being back here, but um, Hunger Mountain. Hunger Mountain parking access. So if, you know, with the uh, advent of every kind of app out there. Um, everybody knows where Hunger Mountain is, and in the fall, it's, it's just unbelievable. And so how would, uh, it, to process, how can ANR look to evaluate the impact of that public recreational access? Um, because quite frankly, it's impacting us locally on our roads and parking, and I mean, there's cars at certain weekends. So how does something like that situation, you talked about when you create new, uh, I think Ian was talking mostly about biking, but if there's new biking access, looking at you know providing parking, how do you guys consider that in something specific like this, monitoring this one? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so in there, I think there's a couple pieces. How do we manage the user expectation and, and what and user communication, and then there's how do we decide on new infrastructure, yeah. and how do you think about access in relation to that? Um, so the the first question um, we struggle with that as well. Um, <laughs> we maintain the official source of trail information on Trail Finder, um, which is our our way of communicating, and we have taken steps there to label high use trails and recommend alternatives, so that um, when folks are looking for a hike and say like, oh, I heard Hunger Mountain's great, and you go that this is a high use trail that may be very busy, especially. Between Nine and three on a Saturday, and here's some other areas nearby that are generally less busy that you might consider. So 
people are trying to give people that sense of where else they can redirect to. Um, and of course, that doesn't always work because people still want to go up on hunger. Um, the management of parking areas, we do what we can to make those parking areas accommodate um, the vehicles that we need. Um, sometimes there's a space or it's just not possible because there's too many people. Um, we have worked with towns in the past on collaborating on signage uh, strategies and trying to, again, just do that kind of visitor management and communication to try and get to at least mitigate that impact if we can't solve it. Um, so there's, it, it's, it's a difficult problem with high recreation areas that are already established. For new recreation infrastructure development, part of that review process is can we actually handle the users at the parking area? Like do we have the access point that enables, like you, can't, you don't want to build a trail where there can't, where people can't park then to access it. So we do look at that as part of the recreation project review process that I was describing before is how are people going to get there and is that, can that be accommodated? How do you evaluate the volume? That is based on our rec specialists, primarily assessment of what the, you know, they, they know the other rec assets in the area that are similar user groups, um, so they know what the volumes are gonna be. We have trail counters that we deploy, we have vehicle counters that we deploy that understand what the kind of peak usage is, when are people coming in, how many people at a day, and what drives that. So we do get that picture of seasonality and the picture of um, parking versus how many people end up on the trail and where, how far down the trail did they make it. So, we rely on some of that kind of uh, understanding of recreation uses at other places to say, like, if we add this asset here, we know it's a gap, we know this is going to be an attractive place, and that's what we might expect to use. Um, but that's, it's not an easy thing to like model, so as we really do rely on a rec specialist's expertise for that. I think, I think I'd add, you know, if, if this is a consistent problem or an evolving problem, and if it's possibly even getting worse, you know, I think we will work with you to try to identify solutions. This has happened at the Burroughs Trailhead on Camel Sun. Yeah. Yeah. It's happened at Willoughby State Forest and South End of Lake Willoughby. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and the, the Camel Sun Burroughs Trailhead is still very much an issue we're trying to address at Willoughby State Forest because we had access to land. We put in some additional parking. We mm -hmm. prevented people from parking along Route 5 there both by using a mixture of signs and barriers. And, you know, it's not a perfect solution, but it's, it's some steps in the right direction. So I think if if the, over, the heavy use of Hunger Mountain on autumn weekends is leading to people parking on the street and causing problems for uh, local residents and other issues, you know, road use, et cetera, please stay in contact with us and we can explore options. Um, you know, what do we need? Do we need to do a better job of signage and preventing people from parking? If the lot's full, we've got to go somewhere else. Is there a satellite parking lot that we can consider? Those types of issues. You know. Do you ever have Monitoring staff, like, a, like on a. We have people that will go. We don't have people that go and stay. It just yeah. counts. Yeah. We, are, we don't have the capacity yeah. to, to do that. No, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, I mean, if you, correct me if I, if I miss you something. No, you're right. We we don't not in not in this area. We don't have that um, capacity. We have done it for um, certain high use waterfall sites down in our southeastern yeah. district. We hired a waterfall. So periodically, but they weren't on site all day right. counting or no. cleaning. The other thing we have done um, in our partnership with GMC, they do have caretakers who will um, have presence at parking areas during high use times. Um, uh, the Monroe Trail is one where we've had a, a caretaker yeah. stays there so they can interact with visitors there, but that's really leaning heavily on, that, on the capacity of our recreation partners for some of those very high use trails. discussion about parking and the trail head. Is the Perry Hill mountain bike trails or in this management plan as well? But you know, I see that more frequently, whereas the parking for it all I think is on town land. And yet the recreation occurs on the state land and um, yeah, I, yeah, I've seen it overflow frequently down there on summer evening. So I'm wondering, is there a plan to look at the capacity of those trails and the connection between the parking and the use? Or I know we're 
a little bit concerned about mountain biking up in the watershed, but that's going to be a little work in with the manager and other um, organizations to try to deal with that. But I, I'm just curious about the parking down at the Perry Hill uh, trails there. Yeah, I, um, I can't, I'd have to go back and ask a little bit more of what specific plans might have to do any assessment of the um, parking and what might be done differently because of the arrangement of ownership. I know it's a challenge, but like, it's just a different combination that we usually deal with where we have the parking asset manager ourselves um, on state land. So I have to go back to you on if there's any particular need to plan to alter and ban for that parking area. I know we've commented in our meetings how there's plenty of parking at the ice center, but every you know they're coming there to mountain bike, but they all want to park right close <laughs> to the trail end instead of parking down at the ice center and riding their bike up. But I think that's kind of another area to Oliver's point earlier that um, like where those where these the specific pain points there might be some solutions that we've seen in other places that we could apply here. So it'd be great to have more conversations about. Yeah, no, I mountain bike there. It is, it's fantastic. <laughs> We're gonna charge you a fee. The one time I went there, the lot was full. Uh, I actually drove maybe 100 feet down and parked on the side of the road. I did exactly what you don't want a user to do. But that was that was a long time ago. <laughs> but I think some signage, the town in collaboration with Watt, I could, could easily put up some signage. And you know, remind the cyclists that they're using town land, public land, and they're here as a guest. Mm -hmm. And that the lot is full, but there's an alternative a quarter mile down the road at the ice center. And when you're on a bike, it's easy to park down there and, and cycle back before you head up into the woods. So I, I think I agree with, with what Jim said. That sounds like it's a pain point, and the the state, the town, and water could hopefully work together to find a solution. No, it's a great, you know activity to bring people to the Waterbury and things. And uh, I don't know if they've had events there or not, but there are different times. And it's pretty full. We, in fact, had some private party out of state call. This is what the village owned. They wanted us to sell them a half acre of land because they wanted to develop a concession there or something mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. make a profit off the we weren't interested in doing that. <laughs> Thank you. I have some comments and questions. I'm just going to move up here. Yeah, come on up, Cindy. I don't. Yeah. That's right. Cindy Parks with people. So, I'm a drinking water engineer. We have been for many, many years. Um, we have availed ourselves of your staff. So these issues are not unique to EFA. They are statewide, no surprise. And I think um, in the years to come, there will be more and more partnerships to go for this. Um, and we're really grateful for the expertise that you have and have shared with us. And we will be reaching out again, I'm sure. I'm really glad you 
who avails yourself of Walter is a fantastic resource. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that's the level of collaboration we need to have on those um, issues where we have that social trail development and cross boundary. So I uh, hope we'll, we'll do have more conversations with him. Right, right, I'm sure we will. Um, and I'm also glad that it, this provided us with the opportunity to introduce ourselves and say, we have watershed protection zones up here. And it's in everybody's best interest to know who their neighbors are and what their needs are. So um, I'm not worried about the logging. I, I know it's planned for the east side, but even if it wasn't the west side, we do logging as part of management of our watershed line plans as well. It's like a part of the years, so it's very important. Um, as a public water system, we are required every 10 years to update our source so the next time that is up, which I think is in eight years, um, I'm sure we will be reaching out for some discussions. Yeah, I mean, we share your concerns. We talk a lot about the environmental services that folks can provide, and clean water is at the, close to the top of the list, um, along with habitat and carbon sequestration. And the finding that balance between allowing people to, to under your rules, use the area but not degrade um, the, 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 the water source is, is extremely important. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that what happens upstream on our lands isn't having a negative impact. I and mean, if those ways we can help people with the you know, some social trails, not just with your lands, from any expertise or lessons on the Hi there. I, I don't have anything other uh, other than to say thank you for coming, first of all. And and Jim, thanks for the opportunity to chat and, and handle the, the specific um, questions I'd raised. I think everyone else's discussions are, you know, in line with what I'm concerned about as well. Um, kind of ensuring that we can support using land as planned um, in and, and that specific area. So I don't need to belabor that. But again, I really appreciate your opportunity to come here and, and ask our input. Yeah. Um, I guess I don't really know how this operates. So, and I'm going to focus on Shoesville and Wildlife Corridor. So, it's 510 acres. It's put into special management. It's considered a critical habitat. And I never understood why, and it's adjacent to highly sensitive areas. I don't understand why the corridor wasn't put into the highly sensitive areas when we have spent in Waterbury um, and Stowe tremendous amount of resources trying to protect this resource and I don't I just I'm trying to figure out how you I don't, use, I don't want to use the word downgrade but how it went to special management as opposed to highly sensitive it didn't it didn't change we made that comment early on I made that comment early on but it wasn't upgraded and I'm curious about the thinking about why such a critical habitat 510 acres, 510 acres wasn't put with the rest of the, the adjacent highly specialized management area. I see. Um, so you know, the question is really specifically, you, you saw the special management, you were seeing that should be highly sensitive management and didn't see that change. So that's yes, that's correct. And then just for clarification, this is the Green Crow parcel that has a conservation easement on it as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah just make sure. Um, so the, it's a great question. And um, the definitions of the highly sensitive management area and a special management area are slightly, um, the answers in that nuance in that highly sensitive management area means there is something about the site or the physical characteristics of the site that are, um, have a, such a degree of sensitivity they're thin soils or steep slopes or um, easily damaged by trampling. Like there's something about the uh, site characteristics that make uh, certain types of management completely incompatible, especially like having heavy equipment. So if you look at our highly sensitive management area definition, you would never see salvage logging or commercial harvesting in those areas because of the sensitivity of the soils and the sites. Right. Um, and the special management areas can accommodate a wider range of management in theory. 
but there is something, there's a primary goal that needs to be managed for in that area. So it's a combination of what's the goal of management and how much uh, management intensity or management um, can that, I'm trying to think of like, intensity might be the right word, how much management intensity can those soils on that site take. So that area is considered special management. I, my understanding, this is before my time during the department, so I wasn't there for these discussions, but I'm, I'm researching the, on this. That area wasn't seen as um, sensitive to operations, but it had this special goal of wildlife corridor maintenance. Right. And so rather than just putting special management, just general biodiversity, it's special management wildlife corridor, because that's the objective that has to be managed above all others. So and it, there might be a wider range of uses that could be considered there. Um, maybe there'd be mechanical treatment of invasive plants as opposed to herbicides, so if you could get, get in with right. light equipment. I'm better. specifically thinking about recreation. Yeah, and so the recreation so piece, again, is like, that's got to be compatible with the primary objective, which is wildlife corridor maintenance. So if the recreation can't be compatible with that, then that, that goal is given primacy over other uses. Right. So how do you balance those two? Mm -hmm. Because if you look at what's happened um, in your waterworks, we started with some small hiking trails, and now it is a maze of social trails, bike trails, that no one has the resources to look at, and it's all carved up. Be, I'd be concerned with the top of the Worcesters, top of Shootsville, sort of no one being able to wa actually watch what's going on. And, and having, I, I, I guess what I was looking for was more a thumb on the scale of the conservation, particularly since highly sensitive management is uncommon. It's, it's, it's not critical, and it wasn't just about soil, was the definition in the language. So I was hoping the thumb would be on the scale of keeping, keeping is particularly that high up, <coughs> keeping the conservation mission, keeping the corridor in not just doing the balancing. Yeah, and again, I think it's the, the difference there is the, the susceptibility to site is just not the same as it is at the higher elevations, and that, that's my, that's, that's how I understand the definitions were applied in this case. But I think the change of that from a special protection area, because it had a conservation easement on it, which is the original designation, yeah. it was called special protection area, there's a conservation easement that has requirements, so it's called a special protection area, and the transition of that to the wildlife corridor was really meant to um, make sure that that particular value wasn't overlooked by like, a future round of us who are sitting around trying to make decisions on the plan. So I don't think that the, I, I guess I, I, I don't see highly sensitive management areas as being inherently more protective. I see them as signaling the level of management that a site can tolerate and the goals that are articulated for any given designation are <coughs> what's most important. So a special management with this wildlife corridor it's about the corridor provision, and it's that's right. got to be the primary goal. So, I think that was an area, if I recall, that could have hosted some additional recreation infrastructure, be maybe a good area for a parking area. So there's something about it that I know that was. Well, I'm thinking a higher up. You wouldn't. You're not. You wouldn't okay. That so maybe I, maybe I've got my locations wrong, yeah, yeah. and I apologize. Right. Um, but I think there's there's a real conscious decision to elevate the wildlife corridor component of that right. um, to make sure that that was represented. And the other thing is you talk about encouraging more education corridor and things like that. And I know Jens is kind of, kind of all over this. Um, does that need more resources or we just get a piece of Jens all the time? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everyone wants a piece of Jens all the time. I think, but, um, in terms of encouraging court, I think that uh, I'm not so familiar with that, so I tend to be okay. the intent of that. We'd love to see and more of that. And, and, you know, is that something within the, um, that is, is, uh, the text you saw in the plan that you're thinking of? I just want to make sure I uh, there was text. I think it was one of the main strategy okay. was about foster and courage, more collaboration and education. Okay, yeah, There's too much of this for me to remember at all. <laughs> um, I can look into specifically what was envisioned for that particular area um, and get back to you with what I did the district. Particularly if we're going through our planning process. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and I think A and R writ large, the Department of Forest Parks and Rec specifically is has staffed up for additional capacity and education and outreach. Great. This has been an area where we haven't uh, perhaps given suitable attention in the years past, but now within our Department of Forest Parks and Rec, which is you know, around 62 full-time staff, we have a communication that we lead, and the, the special assistant to the commissioner who was recently hired also has communication and outreach expertise, <coughs> and is, the great thing is the funding to actually implement some communication which activities has been part of some of our recent grant, uh, successful grant applications. Um, so we are hoping to do a better job of 
communicating that that was the importance of this multiple use management approach. Well, I, I, I wasn't that. criticizing. I'm no, no, I'm saying this is the goal we have of, that. of doing a better job. You're telling our story more effectively and partnering with the local organizations to yeah. communicate. We're, we're trying to achieve this management outcome in this part of the forest, and here's how we're going to do that. Here's what you as the public can do to contribute to that. Thanks. Thanks, Any other questions? Well, I wanted to thank you for coming. I think uh, all of us got something out of this. Um, it did. There is one last uh, little project we have in mind uh, about uh, expanding parking. I understand that you're interested in expanding parking capacity, maybe particularly at uh, the Hundred Mountain Trail end. Is, uh, I, I've heard that. I don't know. And maybe you can just tell me if that uh, is a possibility. Um, I don't. I can't speak to that now. I have to talk to Walter and know more about what his what he's already discussed. Um, okay. I can get back to you about that. All right. right. The, the, the plan contemplates something at similar at Stowe Pinnacle. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. 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 So. Yeah. There's been a lot of improvement at Stowe Pinnacle yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and the uh, Pinnacle uh, Meadow uh, area. Um, anyways, uh, the town manager and myself and a few others have got a few ideas in mind that we'd love to talk to you about. All right, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you guys. Appreciate, Appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Tell Becca we miss her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say thank you to you and all of you. And if folks are really interested in this type of topic, we have to do it locally. And I'm not just saying it because the planning commission members are here, but on the home page of the town website, you can also take the survey about our town plan that's open till December 1st. And I forgot to say a public comment. So thanks for letting me ride your boat. I'm just saying we have to do. Thank you. And I have the handouts with the QR codes if you want them right now. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the homepage of the town website. It's on the homepage. Shameless advertising. I think it's the moment. Next on the agenda, we have the housing trust. Joe Camarada, the chair of the housing task force, and uh, Owen uh, with the uh, Revitalizing Waterbury, and uh, the development officer. Come forward. Yeah, I'm going to share my screen. Oh, sorry. Right. Probably need to take and I believe the town manager has your presentation. Now. Thank you, Roger. Um, just as a reminder, we had the opportunity to present to the select board on October 8th a recommendation for the housing trust fund. But before we need that recommendation, we reviewed with you some of the uh, recent data that we had collected with regards to housing, especially affordability housing here on the library. And I just wanted to touch on a few of those points as we launched into this conversation. You know, one of the things that we discovered is that you know, since 2020, the demand for housing has dramatically impacted the supply. So we looked at that, we were able to say we a population based on population growth and household growth that it greatly exceeds the amount of supply that we have, and that's even before we take into account the number of short units that have been converted over a short term okay? So that, and that had then the impact on home prices, for example, of you know, the home prices in libraries have increased at double the rate they have on the state as a whole. And just from an affordability topic or perspective, if you look at, you know, a two-earner income family, they're able to afford a house of about four hundred and twenty-five thousand, and the average three-bedroom house is selling now for over five hundred. So you have about a hundred thousand dollar gap in just that. And if we take that to the renters, what we saw is that over fifty percent of the renters and all of the renters that are below the median income for hundred dollars fifty-two thousand are cost. And a significant number of those are over the age of 65. So we really I, I wanted to draw in on the housing trust fund as a vehicle for addressing affordability. So the recommendation, Tom, if you were, the recommendation that we made, you know, kind of has several pieces to it. You know, we, we suggested establishing an objective for the fund. We defined what affordable means in terms of how it would be measured. We gave some guidance in terms of what type of um, housing should be prioritized with that fund. Um, we gave some 
direction in terms of how the fund should be funded uh, through the local option tax. And you know, the last point was we recommended that the housing trust fund be a 501c3 um, so that other institutions, be they employers or private individuals, can make travel contributions. So where we left off with Hugo Town, in the next slide, where we left off on that last meeting was there's kind of four topics of discussion that were left, that were left open. Um, at, go, go back to the last slide. Three, four more. You asked us to confirm the amount of what the fair market rent is for Waterbury, and I'm going to address that. Um, you had also asked us to assess employers' interest in a housing trust fund. I was going to speak to that topic. Um, you asked us to investigate the nonprofit uh, using a nonprofit as the 501c3, and I just wanted to give examples from two other municipalities and, and, and summarize the discussion I had with RW on this topic. And then the last topic that came up was there was a request for what do you think the initial program should be? And the housing trust fund did have the, I'm sorry, the housing task force did have the opportunity to discuss that and make a recommendation. So let me go through the first two points and then the sli other slides will address the last two. So one of the reasons this is important. The first one is we define affordability as being defined by, go back up Tom, on the fair market rent toll of, um, of Waterbury. And the HUD fair market rate is actually set on a county level, not on a township level, right? So the question is what is it for, what is it for, water, or what is it for Washington Township? And that rate is $1,100 for a one bedroom apartment in 14 15. Now we did this because we talked about using it as one of the parameters in defining the program. And I reached out to, um, actually to Young Street about this topic, and they said, that's great, this is what the state requires, but if you were to have your own VHIP program, you can make your own parameters. You don't need to abide by the state's parameters for the VHIP program. So we felt that, and I think there was some concern that those numbers were too low for Waterbury, then we could adjust that as a and didn't your figures indicate that yourself? Uh, it seems as though that 1100 for a uh, one bedroom unit is not uh, what is currently uh, uh, considered affordable in, in Waterbury. Yeah. Waterbury tends to have higher rates than the rest of Washington. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. In general, you know, that's one of the things. So, but again, it's there. We should take it into effect. We should take it into consideration when we're designing programs. But it's not a reason. On assessing the employer's interest, I wouldn't yeah. have done a lot of reach out, maybe you can. Um, so I did a fair amount of outreach on this. Um, I did not, if I'm being totally honest, get a lot of responses. I reached out mainly to the larger uh, firms in the area, um, mainly their philanthropy and, or HR people. Um, and for the <coughs> most part, I mean, this is a time of year in which philanthropy is fairly busy and the ask, I think, is, is kind of vague at the moment. Um, but I was able to speak to Core Power, um, and they did indicate that down the line they would be interested in supporting something along these lines. And um, the individual I spoke to, uh, she said that finding housing is definitely an issue in terms of talent retention for their employees. Um, she thinks that the majority of them would prefer to own homes if they could, but that doesn't seem viable. And um, she actually moved back to Vermont recently and had to um, sign a lease uh, on an hour turnaround in order to find a place to rent within Waterbury. Uh, so I thought that was fairly, at least that was one, one company that gave a relatively good example. I can also say that um, when WADC is having discussions, generally the only the only time our prior will jump in as he's pretty busy is if we're talking about housing stuff and he is pretty adamant that uh, more housing would make it easier for him to find employees. Um, yeah, that's about all I've got. So my far. prior was uh, past chair of the select board and uh, the other of uh, the restaurants and a couple of other restaurants in the area. Yeah, um, yeah that's, that's where that's at. So one of the topics was where, where should the trust fund be housed? So we had a discussion about should we use a nonprofit so we put uh, RW to do that. Uh, Tom countered and said, well, we could actually set that up 
inside the town, and the town can also provide 501c, 501c status for um, tax deductible donations. So what I wanted to do was just kind of look at how two other municipalities handle that, and most, most specifically, how they directed how the funds should be allocated. So there just wasn't a bunch of funds here that was the hilly or whatever they, it was actually direction. Mm -hmm. And um, if we could, Tom, look, I, I first I reached out with Owen's help to um, Montpelier and to their housing, their housing trust fund. And they actually have three programs here on the left-hand side. I'm not going to go through them, but one of them, the second one, is actually an expansion of the VHIP program for Montpelier re re residents. And the way that they have actually decided to um, direct, if you would, that fund is so that the, the town has a direct transfer into the, to, to a housing trust of 110,000, or at least it was 110,000 this past year. But they've established guidelines for how the money should be used. So you see this little bit of, the guidelines say that there should be 150 reserves, although there was 110. But that, that should be made available for affordable housing grant which are actually, if you would, kind of larger development, developments that might be five to twenty years. Yeah. 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 for these affordable housing project grants, but in the case that there are no projects that year, they mm -hmm. actually allow them the money to flow into the accessory dwelling unit loans. Um, and you can see that kind of down below. So they basically have, of their three programs, a prioritization of those programs. There was the one, and there's money left over, then it flows down to the, to the next two. Okay, so that's how they've established the use of the I asked so is the ADU, what's the other one? So the first one is the affordable housing project grant, the project, which goes yeah. to developers that are doing bigger projects, mm -hmm. and the ADUs, and they have a shared equity down payment assistance program also. Mm -hmm. So I asked them what was their experience of reaching out and trying to augment these with private funds. So we go to the next slide, Tom, please. So they, they're in the guidelines that says that they allow additional revenue to the fund, includes bequests, donations, grants, gifts from private and public sources. I said, that's really great. How do you make that with that? And they said that they really haven't discussed any proactive strategies for how to solicit funds from residents, businesses, and foundations. You know, they say that some businesses in, in the school district, they express an interest on housing projects, but they're not in a position where they can fund it with capital. Mm -hmm. But we're in a position where they can maybe buy down the rent or something like that, subsidize the rent or something, then they can actually make a con a capital contribution. But they did know that there are private residents that contribute to nonprofits in the city that are working on housing solution for what they do. So they know that goes on, but it goes on separate from them and they're not involved in it. So they really don't have a private element of the funding at all at Montpelier at, at this time. And did you say this is a 501c3 or is it a the house? Set up the as town. a 501c3 for the city, yes, yeah, so they could con conduct that additional revenue, but they uh -huh. just have to. Yeah. The money they're working with is only the money that's been provided by the city, and I think they have some community development block grants also. Okay. I reached out to Woodstock, because they were highlighted in an article on seven days around the programs that, that they have. So I reached out to Jill Davis, who was the, um, the person who was interviewed there, right? And they actually had two approaches. So they had, through their Economic Development Commission, a housing working group. And that is funded by the local options tax. And you can see on that left-hand side, there are the types of programs that, are, that, that they fund. They, they generally fund programs that are targeted at in addition to that, 
there is a community trust fund, which is completely separate from the government, private, nonprofit, it's only 501 seats. It's funded through grant and private donations. Um, and what they're really doing is helping people um, who live in the community, or work in the community, actually, I should say, who work in the community to, to buy houses. So they're actually doing a kind of down payment assistance. And they've been really successful. I mean, they've raised, they, they put $700,000 in assistance on the street this is January, and they have enough for five or six additional properties. Just roughly speaking, what they target, they probably have raised about a million dollars, you know, just as that private group in order, in order to do that. It's pretty impressive, you know. But again, they are separate. There is the, the, the money from the town, which sits in the Economic Development Commission, and then there's the community trust fund, which is over here. There's some people who serve on both that one board and the other commission, but it's separate. Joe, so the 700,000 is that's the private investment? And grants. And grants, okay. Mm -hmm. Then I had a conversation with RW and simply I told them a little bit about what we were doing and what we would like. And they offered to act as a um, financial agency for uh, it. So it's, a, it's the same arrangement they have with CRU. So CRU is a nonprofit but it's not a 501c3. So what they do is they actually um, go to RW, and I can right? Yeah. <laughs> Jump on this, yeah. Um, so pretty much um, all their, the crew money runs through RW um, for the most part. Um, we uh, take on liability. Um, they get to take advantage of our tax uh, tax exempt status, um, and so on and so forth. Um, they have a separate board, they have a separate board of directors, they have separate employees, and so on and so forth. It's just pretty much that all payroll, grants, et cetera, et cetera, uh, we have to sign off on and uh, runs through RW. Um, in terms of accountability, the approach that we've had is uh, Karen and now me um, pretty much sign off on all checks go going to crew and then um, anything coming from crew. Um, and also have one of our board members who sits on Cruise board as well. Um, I think part of the appeal for the housing trust, at least, is it is a lot less day-to-day -day, um, money management than Crew is. Crew is pretty consistently, money is going in and out constantly. I think the housing trust would be a little less busy on that side of things. Um, and yeah, that's about it. And do you assess them uh, uh, administrative fee? Not at the moment. I think we hit them with a startup fee, I believe, in terms of kind of starting up the fiscal agency. Um, but at the moment, there's no administrative fee. But we might discuss that. Um, and then in terms of the housing trust fund, let's be honest, a little more. Um, is RW is at the point where they're interested in, in taking this on, um, but we need to wait until things are a little more stable and start of 2025 is when we would actually have the ability to take this on. I just don't want to confirm anything without the board of directors like fully confirming it yet. Um, but our board president um, has said that this is likely something they would be interested in. But I think to summarize what we saw, what we heard when we looked at the others is that, you know, there are examples, I mean, where the, the town is funding it through their own 501 C3, and that the way that they um, they use programs actually to direct how those funds should be dispersed. And you know, Montpelier, in addition to the programs, had guidelines in terms of prioritizing the programs. I did not see that from Woodstock. They just had the four different programs, and I guess depending on what applications they get is how they decide to disperse their money. Mm -hmm. But it's it's done through the town, and you know, at least in the Woodstock case, there's a private ent entity that is also in the town doing. Non competing work, I should say. Right. Yeah. So, so then the, for all the last things. topic I wanted to was going <laughs> through the programs, okay? Yeah. So, the, 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 um, you asked us, you know, the housing task force, what types of programs. And we discussed a number of different programs things that are planning, things are development oriented. And what the task force recommended was to start with also helping to fund the 
of the program because we felt that it was important that to show early success we have, we have every link that we can share with the community that demonstrates that the money is being used to improve housing or making progress in this area. That's how you build awareness. That's how you build momentum. Mm -hmm. We know from that last bullet point that the vehicle has already gone to help the builder restore 946 units. And I kind of wanted to know how Waterbury stood with that, so I reached out to Downstreet, and since the beginning of last year, there's been eight applications from Waterbury residents for, for VHIP projects and for what happened to be. So it's, it's known actually here in, in, in the town. We already have some people that are, you know, that are, that are taking advantage of it. And I guess, you know, we can craft a program. We don't have to craft exactly the state program, but we can craft a program that we believe is right for us and then use that to augment. As Tom pointed out, that could be administered by Brown. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. okay. Questions for Joe and Owen? Yeah. I have a question, Joe. Um, maybe Owen could answer this too. You mentioned that the in the RW scenario that the money goes directly to RW. Is, is it separate funded that, that there's a line item in the RW budget that would be for this housing trust fund? Or how does that, I, I assume it just doesn't go within the mix of the entire RW budget. Um, how we have it set up right now is that crew has a separate uh, account within our bank and uh, we itemize pretty much anything that comes in and out of crew as a crew item. Okay, so it is segmented. It is separate, yeah. not, just it, within your full yeah, budget. That, yeah. that would be too, <laughs> a, a, a little concerning. Mm -hmm. That would get really chaotic really quickly. Uh, but yeah, it's all restrictive funds. Too. Okay, thanks. Other questions? Yeah. I wanted to point out if, if you, I gave my addition away. Um, if you scroll back up, yes. If you go to the initial proposed recommendation here. <coughs> The last paragraph of the recommendation, specific program recommendations and limits will be presented when funding amount is final. Um, we've talked about the assisting the HIP program, I think more than we've talked about anything else when it comes to this trust. And I think that was the only thing that a majority of the board agreed on when we were debating it before. Um, and as Joe pointed out, um, as a trial run, it seems like a good use of the program to, to test if we have success with it. So that would be my recommendation as well. Um, yeah, that's what I got. I lost my train of thought right there. <laughs> Kane, how would you be proposing that, that the VHELP money would be administered? I think noting Tom's concerns and then noting RW's willingness to participate, um, we can execute a combination of the two where the 501c3 is, is created through the town um, with RW at, acting as the fiscal agent. Is, am I to understand that correctly? I think, I think it would, if it's through the town, it's a separate gotcha. 501. We're a fiscal agent if it's separate from the town. But I think Tom's, Tom brought some concerns up um, our last discussion about this, where he thought it should fall under town management um, with, our, with our own 501c3. I'm not inherently objective. I don't inherently object to RW um, having, a, having a management role here. And I think it'd be great to have an organization not directly connected to the town to do things like screen applications. We don't want to be in that business at all. Yeah. What I will say is the town today between the town and the library is, you know, sitting on three million bucks of funds that are invested and we, we've been doing that for a long time and the town should retain and manage the cash until it's allocated to projects. That money shouldn't be sitting with RW. We should be we should be investing that and, and, and taking the earnings and applying them to other things, if not the housing trust fund. Uh, there's a model for that already, um, and that exists in spades and town government. Part of it, part of it is just, just having been in this business for a long time, 
to get the 501c3, the large budget and responsibilities, and at some point in time, that 501c3 just has more authority in the community. And and over time, I've seen those relate. I've seen that occur where the boards have less control over time, and then you've got to wrestle it back a little bit, and that can be difficult. So I think just keeping the money here until it's determined to be allocated serves us better. Doesn't mean that that. RW can't be making decisions on the ground. I think that'd be great to say here, you get the VHIP money, um, applicant A versus applicant B. Um, it's part of it. Um, it's really, that's really my biggest concerns right there. Tom, in, in that scenario, what, what will Downstreet look like? Um, I mean, if Downstreet is, manage, is, if Downstreet is managing the VHIP, then, when, then, if the, then if there's cash available for the program, there's applicants, and I think Downstreet does all that screening. I think that's perfect. That is 100% of business we should never be in. Right. So what you're saying is they kick, they, they have a VHIP applicant in Waterbury, we're notified, and if they've screened the applicant, the applicant has passed the screening, then we provide whatever funding we have agreed upon. I think that's a great model. We don't want yeah. to be in that business of screening. No. And there's follow up too because you make commitments as partners that they're going to be Right. Um, All right. Um, doesn't um, bring out currently we have been on other work so we figured out to take on our own data. So we can show you because they have to be in water because we have to be in the water. Yeah. It's usually when we have exhausted the problems. Yeah. State funds first. When state funds are exhausted, then we would have funds that would be specific for the residents. Roger. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. To your to the Woodstock model, is there a, a conversation about prioritizing? Like, if you have these private funds in the trust fund in the Woodstock trust fund, do do are folks encouraged to go there first and then come to the town, or vice versa? Hmm. To the economic development in this scenario. Focused on rentals, and the community trust fund is on home purchasing. So that's how it's what? Uh, home purchase. Purchase. Okay, home purchase. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, 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 that's it. so that's how they broke it up. And that's kind of how we keep things straight down there. So, yeah. if you're looking to buy a home, you go to the community foundation. But if you're looking at assistance for rentals, then I think you know, valuable to have you know sort of prioritizing or sort of differentiating. Exactly. And I think with the participation um, focused on a pro program like VHIP, we sort of get the best of both worlds, right? You get an ADU or an apartment, and then the person who's building it adds value to their property. Mm -hmm. So you both do right by the homeowner and you do, do right by the renter. It's not a huge down, I don't see a huge downside in assisting this program specifically. Any other questions for uh, Jill or Owen? I've got kind of an, yeah. an easy one, I think. I'm just about process, I guess, about reviewing application. Initially, it'll be VHIP reviewing application, or is it housing? Who's, who's reviewing those applications? So I think actually? the model that Tom had proposed before is if we go with VHIP, that we could use downstream to administer okay. that. So they would be the, the face, if you would, right? Yep. So a, a resident from Waterbright would apply. They, if they want to apply for VHIP, they go through downstream anyway. Yep. Downstream does so yeah. they would go there, and then they would do the screening. They might come back and say, these are the residents. The funds could be released for them. And then they would do the follow-up to make sure all the commitments were met. OK. Does, does the housing task force have any role in this? Or I would they... hope not. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I, think the, I think the housing task force would play a role in helping to design the program, make sure yeah, there's sure. parameters and things like that, and for other programs. But I don't think it would be the people you want to admit. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Oh, one other quick question. Um, so the goal is I have to work with affordable rentals. Or is it that? So that is actually one of my initial comments, but I'm going to encourage the people to think about what. I mean, we recommend the goal. That 1% of rentals.
So, um, in about a month, Down Street is going to have a kickoff event for 51 South Main Street. Um, you know, let's call it 18 months construction. I don't know their exact timeline. And so those 26 units, um, they can make any money. I will answer that too by saying they have two already um, apartment buildings with affordable, quite a few affordable rentals within them, and it has not seemed to make a dent in the climb of other rentals. Probably speak on this slightly as well. Um, the vacancy rates um, within Washington County, which is the lowest kind of like as granular as you can get in terms of vacancy rates, is hovering, I think, in like the 1.4, 1.5% range for um, rental units. It is the second worst in the state after Chittenden. Um, a healthy vacancy rate unit or measure for, for rentals is generally 5%. Um, and a lot of that just comes down to the fact that. Um, housing is incredibly demand in the last day where people don't really jump around very often. So generally, once you're set in a place, you're set unless there are other options or uh, not any sort of reason to, to move on. So in terms of 26, it's probably not going to do too much to be in that. Back in the envelope, we have about 700 rescue units, so that would say we have to have at least 35 of them to get back to a healthy And then one other question. Talk about VHIP and how town money would be used when VHIP runs out. Um, not to piggyback on the program, not to say you're getting 50,000 through VHIP, now yes. you're getting 80. Right. Um, and you talked about how we could set our own criteria, so what changes would you recommend? Well, obviously there's some concern about the, the um, AMR, right, that we could, we could, we could adjust. Um, you know, I know that Montpelier has made some changes to the Contribution it was 20%, and I think they've lowered that. Honestly, Tom, we haven't discussed it in detail to have anything, um, but we can come back with that. Do you um, have you had any conversations with? Um, I guess is anyone are you aware of anyone tying it to local employment? I know I've heard that theme a few times. Woodstock, Woodstock has a program that is tied to local. One of their programs is tied to local employment. Yeah. When I spoke to their people six months ago, the first one, the... That, but that's not a B, are you asking about VHIP? It's not VHIP specific, <coughs> that's Woodstock right. specific, yeah. and yes, it's tied to local employment. Well, actually, I had the program this week here. They just have ADU workforce, they, they call it ADU workforce panel, it's going to like property owners to create new men in ADU. But whether that's to VHIP or not, I'd have to... How would you deal with kind of an extension of what Tom's question, because that's where I was going to. I know we want to prioritize local people, you know, who work in the local businesses, but there are a number of Waterbury residents who probably live here, but, you know, in this day and age of telecommuting, they could work for a national company but reside here in Waterbury. How would you deal with that kind of issue? Is that considered a local person, or is that, or they considered a Dallas, Texas person? So usually, uh, when you talk about workforce, you talk about the employer more than the employee. Right. And the employer is based. It could be a business. It could be a government agency. It could be a school. Right. The okay. Employer is based. So that's the way you're thinking of where, wherever the employer is based, not necessarily. Not the not the employee, even if it's remote work. And I think there's something to be said about building more units anyway will still help people who work in industries like that. Right. Where you increase the amount of units, you increase the amount of options. So right. yes, if, even if it starts off as local workforce housing, so to speak, you're still going to open up more housing for people that in other industries. That would go to yeah. different things, yes.
say thank you um, to <laughs> Joe for doing the work. And personally, what I really appreciate is the like mixing and matching and having the reference from different communities. I will say, to, like to me, I think just to me, like the town has already supported affordable housing creation, so we did allocate one hundred thousand dollars of ARPA funding to the Down Street project. So I really appreciate that Montpelier's reserves that as an allowable use, recognizing that you're not necessarily going to have a project of that scale every year, but if and when that comes to pass, it's important to have resources to contribute locally. Um, we had the chair of the Heinsberg I believe, Housing Committee come to speak to us, and it was something he commented he, were, he wished they had started doing sooner because they would have a compelling project. And again, these nonprofit housing developers are pulled in a lot of different directions, so it really took a local contribution to be meaningful. So just, I think the option to reserve things that couldn't be used for others, and that is really appealing. I will say if I can wave a magic wand, the Woodstock Community Trust Fund model is very compelling to me in that, um, you know, it's a $50,000 if you average, you know, contribution for 14 housing units, $700,000, but it's permanent ownership and it's built into ownership models. In looking at this program, I also really appreciate it because the first thing it says is, are you eligible for the Twin Pine Shared Equity Program, which is the equivalent of Downstreet? That has set income limits. So it's sending folks there first. It's saying, if you already qualify for an existing state program, please go use the existing regional state program. They're filling in that next gap of folks who are not making enough money to, who are making too much money to qualify for those programs, but not enough to fully support it. So what I think we have and what I feel like I'm balancing as a board member is trying to figure out what's the highest and best uses of local resources and then recognizing the constraints of using funds now, having funds for the future. So um, for me, I think working towards something like that community trust fund model that could be NRW, that could be in the future, is really exciting and compelling and I would love to build momentum for. I think there's a lot there before that's up and running. So for now, I think being able to leverage existing programs and keep the money with the town, again, either to support what we're allocating or be set aside for a future housing project is um, where I would be in terms of Potential actions. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions or comments? All right. Thank you very much. I really appreciate I all the work. Just depends on two points. Um, <laughs> <laughs> last word. I would encourage as we move into next year to really think about an objective for affordable housing. And you know, we said one percent, but I, mm -hmm. I want to just give the back of the envelope calculation. Of the mm -hmm. We should have some. As, as a team. I think that would really be helpful. And the other thing is, um, we are planning, the Housing Task Force is planning their 2025 goals and objectives, so we're going to make any recommendations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I would like to tack on, um, before we fully end this discussion, that there was an article in Digger this morning um, outlining Rutland's work toward housing affordability and yes i understand that they have a larger population than we do but their goal by 2028 is 1000 units uh, new units not existing yep 1000 new units and i have not done the math their population versus ours and done the done the long division to figure out what that would equal for us but mm -hmm. i think it would be quite a few uh, we do have a recommendation that uh, we adopt uh, this objective of increasing the affordable housing by 1% uh, a year, um, which we could take on. And uh, we're about to move on to another item on the agenda, which has some good news about the uh, availability of uh, energy. So, uh, we could, could take action. I want to read it right from the script. <laughs> um, trying to figure out how to word this because we already technically have a housing trust fund. It just doesn't have any money in it. Right. Well, and I will just say, I, I appreciate Joe's project as an objective. I guess the background is seven new affordable units a year if they're $50,000 each. And the VHIP program is $350,000 to yep. meet that. So I'm not not accepting the recommendation, but I want to be 
I guess pragmatic about mm -hmm. how much I think we're going to fund it. So that's that's my reservation in just immediately adopting that. It's not because I don't think it's a worthwhile goal, but or maybe it's shooting for an average, recognizing that some years we're going to get two or three, and some years we're going to get fifteen, and that's going to average. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it depends on whether uh, we consider uh, the 51 South Main as a uh, right. publicly funded uh, project. It will be affordable. Uh, we're uh, looking forward to getting 26 units in approximately 18 months, uh, so that could figure into our, uh, uh, the outcome of our objective. Helps our numbers. Yeah. It does. Mm -hmm. And I think understanding Going off of our projected numbers for the local option tax, um, I think it would be, as as Alyssa pointed out, irresponsible <laughs> to throw three hundred fifty thousand no, dollars. No, uh, <laughs> but I think a modest amount um, to try and meet the one percent goal, four to eight units annually. And like you said, there might be years where we have two or three applications and years where we have eight applications. And I think balancing that average is incredibly important. Just to be clear, uh, I was suggesting maybe we finish this discussion with an objective and then hear about where we are with the LOT tax and then move forward with uh, additional uh, suggestions for a particular allocation from this year's funding. I'll make a motion. Okay. Um, I move that the town of Waterbury establish an objective of increasing the town's rental supply, rental housing supply by 1% annually. Go ahead, sir. Can I follow up? I mean, this ask, mm -hmm. <laughs> ask yeah. like the, in the housing chapter of the town plan this is going to look. Like, I'm happy to do this, but I guess I, I hope. I'll second it for discussion. I think you want what? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Of, with affordable options, straight from the script. Yeah. I need to amend my own motion. What does that represent in terms of numbers? It says four to so four, eight four units. Eight, eight, units eight, eight units is one percent. Okay. Four to eight new units uh, with affordable options. Okay, moved and seconded. Uh, open for discussion. To, did you said one percent there, Kane? Yeah, I said well, the objective of one percent. Yeah. Right. So I'm not, you know, an objective is great, but you're not bound, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's not like I, it's not like I moved that the town had to increase <laughs> to eight units a year. It was seriously penalty if not, yeah. Yes, tentatively hope. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you identifying? Did you identify in your motion that it represents eight units? You're just saying. No, it says four to eight. Of what? One. Rental supply of, of the town's rental existing supply? rentals increased by so, 1% of existing rental supply. Is that additional 1% of existing rentals, Joe? Right. So he says establish an objective that the housing trust fund should expand the town's rental supply by approximately 1% annually with affordable options. So I think if that's 770 rentals. That's what I was going to say. It must be between four to 400 eight, yeah. to 800. Right. Well, yeah. It, right. Yes. About, as Joe said, there's about 770 right. rental units in Waterbury. So, um, Ian. To, so we we talked about long-term goals, and that each year we might you know have two this year, we might have 26 next year. Um, That'd be crazy. The should we incorporate that into this objective that it's not each year we're looking at um, potentially eight units, but we're collectively through. Do we want to a set a year frame? Uh, well, Where we have a motion uh, that's yeah. being uh, discussed right now. <laughs> right. Do you we'll clarify the, the final motion. We'll just do you want to set like a year goal, like by 2030, you want to see this many units? That's, yeah, that's one way to do it. I don't know. I'm just raising the question is that does it make sense because of the conversation that we're having that we're making a motion reflective of the conversation we're having? And was your motion to have one percent or? It was. Point? I said one percent. Yeah. Flat. Okay. Yeah. So we can we can amend. We that. can amend. Uh, Versus yeah. 0. 0.5 to one. You could, as Kay said, you could time down that. You could say one percent a year over the next five years, right, or something like that. Mm -hmm. really over and then assess whether that made a dent or really improved things, or whether it needs to be more. Right? 
for you quicker. I wouldn't have any less than five years ago. Yeah. That almost ties in town planning. Yeah, you want to have something. Eight years. Eight years. Eight years. Eight years. Eight years. So we can, tie, we can incorporate that right in as an objective in the housing section. I agree. Right. That's that sounds great. Uh, it accepted. Okay. Um, that was eight years. Eight years. Mm -hmm. well, I second the amendment. Restating it. To, uh, well, should we vote on the uh, friendly amendment? Yeah. Okay. Who made the amendment? Well, I think Kay uh, I will. I will take credit for the friendly amendment. Right. Okay. Well, we'll, 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 yeah. All right. Let's start. Yeah. We'll start right from the from the top. Okay. Uh, can you restate the, the your desired uh, motion? With with all suggested amendments. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. I move that the town of Waterbury set an objective to increase rental supply by 1% annually with affordable options for eight years. Does that suffice? Not to up determine to. determine if it suffices after yes. the motion is done. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Okay, moved and second. Now, does that suffice? Um, does that Discussion. Can you read it back to us? <laughs> I just because I, I think that is there's one important word missing, right? What is, is there, the what is, is the, that important word missing again? That the democracy is nice. Very set an objective to increase the housing supply oh. by one percent annually for the next eight years. Oh, that's yeah. Not, wait, did you say eighty? Eighty. <laughs> <laughs> 80. Oh, okay. And I have the ability to look at the video, so when I miss a word, I just rewatch it. That's yeah. what I, I just mean. want to make sure that word objective was still. Oh in there. yes, objective yeah. is. In Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Any discussion back here? Yeah, Bill. One, one thing about setting the targets, and I agree we should have targets, but I do think they should be like annually revisited because this is a big experiment. And this could be wildly successful, which would be great, or we, we could do more. And I just think putting this target shouldn't mean we, we don't think about it for eight years. Uh, people should come back annually. The housing task force should come back annually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's not one of your motions. I, well, all. that's my comment. Oh. Yeah, Bill. But the point is, as a practice, mm -hmm. I think I think we really need to watch the fund to see if it's having the desired effect. Whether we're increasing stock or helping people get in. Well, we totally agree. And I think I'll right. just mention that this is one initiative, at least this uh, proposal to support the VIA program is one particular initiative, and there could be several others that we contribute towards this, uh, this objective. Yeah, listen. Well, now I'm incorporating, I would say we set it as, do you want me to make a new motion? Or I would propose <laughs> we set an initial objective until town plan adoption, and then the town plan is a actually like long strategic process where we can set an eight year goal. It gives us more recent updating for Billy. So we're setting an initial goal for the funding until we have an adopted town plan. And then the whole purpose of an adopted town plan is to actually create an eight year framework to do things and check in on them. Mm -hmm. so totally Can we agree. put that in as an amendment? Uh, say, no, I think, uh, it, I think it's a whole new thing. <laughs> of the uh, town, revised town plan. Yeah, I'm not sure what your goal here is, Alyssa. Are you saying, uh, I mean, we're going to put an objective, I can already feel the objective coming, you know, of what, a tar what the town's target is. And so I thought the motion would be fine. Are you worried because of the timing? If we don't adopt, if the town plan comes out at the end of 25, we're a year behind the eight years or something? I'm not sure. I was just asking if a more appropriate interim step at this moment was to set an initial target objective for the housing fund that we fund with an initial appropriation with an initial target, and that in the process of creating the town plan in 2025, that would be a moment to set eight years of vision as opposed to the Versus the 1%. You're talking about appropriating funds, and Kate is talking about a target of number of units. Yeah, no, I understand. It's bad. Okay. Not, this is like a semantic, so I don't need to clarify. Okay. Um, I'm fine with it. Is it not a friendly amendment? It sounds like, <laughs> <laughs> sounds like, sounds like it's too broad. Oh, I'm just afraid it wasn't second. Uh, so, mm -hmm. Alyssa, what's your pleasure? Mm -hmm. 
Does it work for you? Yeah, it's fine. Okay. I, I mean, I'm saying it's 1% a year for eight years, so that's, right. I think the point is, if and when we're revisiting that, so I was proposing doing it sooner, and so oh. that's fine. Um, we can always go back and revisit this. Okay. Okay, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, we have an objective. Thank you. One and all for your participation. <laughs> all right. We will now move forward uh, on the discussion of the local option tax allocation. Uh, Colin, if you wouldn't mind giving us an update on uh, recent news that we've heard on the uh, local option tax. Sure, I didn't, didn't write a full memo. Um, First allocation will, if it hasn't been deposited yet, it will be any day now, but it pertains to the third quarter of this year and, and after the uh, the state fees and the 30% the that we don't get to keep, it's $230,000 almost to the penny. Um, when we presented, discussed the charter during the course of um, 2023, we talked about numbers in the six dollars to $50,000 range for the local option tax for the year. Um, since then, um, there is publicly available data in the state website, and 2023 saw really robust growth from 2024, 2022. 2024 has seen growth in the range of 10%. So the third and fourth quarters are the highest quarters historically, averaging between uh, 28 to 30% of the total. But that would put us in an annual range of 750000 to even $800,000. We should think about higher numbers for next year still be conservative, I think, when budgeting, but um, the charter was built on older numbers. We've had two years of good growth, um, and this third quarter was excellent. Um, historically, the fourth quarter is quite similar to the third, so um, we're thinking about a total for this year. Um, you know, again, being conservative, consider maybe $200,000 range, and if we're 230 again, we're happy. Um, back on September 16th, the select board approved allocating $159,000 and change for debt relief and $70,000 for Guptill Road. Um, so essentially this 230 almost to the penny is allocated already. But there's a second distribution that will be booked to this year um, that has not been allocated. Um, so if you're thinking local, if you're thinking housing trust fund, for example, um, those funds are available. If they're not allocated, they're obviously available for future years and reserved. Would anyone care to uh, make motions for uh, further allocation? Well, first, I was going to formally move that we adopt the policy on LOT allocation because I've been in both sets of minutes and I think we're incredibly clear on it that we've had folks in asking questions and I think it would be really nice if we could just have a clean motion regarding the four approved uses we made through voter, so that's the motion I'm gonna make. I second um, that. So, I move to formally adopt the select board policy on allowable ways to use the local option tax as presented to voters in 2023 um, with the four categories of one, payment of existing debt, two, capital expenses, Three, economic development and community vitality efforts, including housing. And four, municipal investments to generate long-term savings and efficiencies. Second that. Who was the third one, Alyssa? I'm sorry. Economic development and community vitality efforts. And to be clear, this is in Tom's PowerPoint. This has been on the municipal website for many months. This is no proposed change in policy. But before we have further discussion, I did just want to codify that this was the intended policy, the policy we've been acting under, and assuming a successful vote on this option, uh, formally adopted mm -hmm. policy. And the last one was municipal? Investments to generate long-term savings and efficiency. Have a second. 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 Right. Second. Further discussion. Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. We do have now a formal policy on the investment of the LRT revenues. <coughs> Any further uh, initiatives? Okay. Um, well, we're getting into 
local option tax allocation, I want to refer back to that last paragraph in the recommendation that Joe put forth. Um, specific program recommendations and limits will, right here, yeah. will be presented when funding amount is finalized. <clears throat> so that tells me that the Housing Task Force and all concerned parties would like a number before they decide what program would work best for us. Mm -hmm. And I think judging by Montpelier's and Woodstock's numbers and not going as high as $350,000. <laughs> I don't think we have $350,000. No, I do not. I do not think that. Um, I think that a fair number falls within the $100,000 range as a seed start to the fund. It allows the task force to see what they can work with with that amount of money and actually have some sort of actual impact depending on the program. So you're proposing a I have not yet made a proposal. Mm -hmm. That was okay. my lead. Yeah, no, great job. <laughs> Preamble. Preamble. Because <laughs> Pre <laughs> last time I didn't have a preamble. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So the three conditions I would ask for by supporting a hundred thousand dollar allocation is I think we should say for programs as recommended to further them, I think we want to specify that the funding is remaining with the town for now. Mm -hmm. um, that a program would need to be administered by a third party. If we feel that's important, I don't want to be too restrictive, but I'm just reflecting that's been our t intent. And then I feel strongly about unallocated funding should continue to be earmarked for future affordable housing. So if we're making this allocation now and there is need and we can spend the funds ASAP to support <coughs> community creation through one of these approved programs, I support it. But if not, in my head, that funding should remain as allocated to support this long-term objective, recognizing kind of the long-term trends we talked about. So a rollover pr provision. Mm -hmm. And again, we don't, that doesn't have to be forever, but for this allocation, those would be the, the requests I would make around. So if, looking if, for a motion? So if you were going to make a motion, Alyssa. <laughs> <laughs> Dueling uh, motions. I would move to allocate $100,000 of presumed 2024 local option tax income to Waterbury's established housing trust fund for programs that further the objective of the fund and are administered by a third party. The allocated funding is to remain in town accounts and funds unable to be expended for the programs would remain until there was an eligible housing project. It's a little too much specificity. Try. Right. That's quite, so quite the story. Really long <laughs> uh, <laughs> do we have a second? Second. I seconded it. Further discussion? Right. Just one question. I know you said administered by a third party. Mm -hmm. Do we want to have any parameters to what a third party would be? Yeah, should we say like affordable housing organization? Like it doesn't necessarily have okay. to be downstream, but someone yeah. would. Right. And affor I, think, I think an affordable housing organization. I think, yeah, that, I think, that, works. I think that, that, that needs to be stated. Yeah. That it can, couldn't just be Joe's Bar and Grill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and Tom, is that one thing that I don't want to, I think we have been clear that we don't want the town in the vetting process. Right. So I guess my right. we want to keep the town. to make that distinction clear as opposed to. Um, I think that's really important, as Tom said. They don't want to get into the business of vetting out applications and stuff. I think we really need a third party to do that. And it will create a lot of transparency, too, so. So we can insert a third party affordable housing organization. And I'm uh, sorry, just one more clear clarification. You said specifically 2024 LOT. LOT, correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Which, again, we don't have in the bank yet, but it's um, the third quarter. 
Right, and this is third it's quarter money that we've already we've allocated already. entirely. <laughs> so this would be that money already spoken for. The money that's being spent as we speak. No. I'd already got spent on cup, so it's great. <laughs> <laughs> so it's quick. Um, yeah. No, I was just going to say, was that an amendment? Was that just on technicality? Was we friendly amendment. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. It has been inserted in the original motion. <laughs> okay. Implied and now it's explicit. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. That motion is taken, and we can move on. Thank you so much. I would like to point out that there was no dollar amount. Yes, there was. Oh, was yeah, there? $1,000. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was in the original motion. I missed it. Uh, she started with that. Oh. No, I missed it. Yeah. All right. Uh, the FEMA buyout, 35 North Main. <laughs> yes, this is the property right here. Um, he is formally requesting a buyout. He had previously been... Um, been in conversations regarding a FEMA elevation. What's been, what's been made clear in, in recent, uh, in the recent month, really, is that um, the available funds for flood mitigation projects, um, which flow through the state and include buyouts, are really overprescribed. The state is really prioritizing buyouts over elevations. So I think once people um, who work with elevations um, hear that, their mind changes a little bit. And, and, and as I've said before, the elevation program is really opaque, really complex, and really time consuming and really risky. Um, and in the end, the, the property owner doesn't get to choose their contractor, which is also a big downside a lot of folks have expressed to me. Um, as of when I heard this last week, um, since the flooding in July of 2023, the, the figure I was provided was that two properties have essentially been approved to be elevated, Still. meaning the grant contracts are, are in place. If that hasn't happened yet, they haven't gone through the full process, but fairly telling. It's two properties statewide, not in Waterbury. That was statewide, okay. Statewide. Um, so very difficult to do. So I think that has changed his thinking. And I'm reasonably hopeful that I think FEMA will approve um, well, 33 North Main is approved. Mm -hmm. The owner there is waiting for the appraisal number from the state whether or not to move forward. Um, the two vacancies on Union Street, um, I think those are 36 and 40 Union Street, maybe 38 and 42, but the two vacancies on Union Street have been approved. Um, and I'm fairly hopeful that the four properties at the bottom of Union have all applied and they'll be approved. So I think these two here and those four will be approved. I'm Less certain about um, Skip Flanders' house at the bottom of Velma, less certain about the houses on Route 2. But I've, I've got a better feeling about, about the bottom of Union and Main Street right here. And all these deadlines keep getting extended. So there was initially an August 15th deadline, then it was November 15th, and now it's January 15th. So he's still able to apply and be in the current round of grants. So the uh, request before us right now is to move to the uh, file at uh, 35 North Main. Is that right? Yep. It hasn't been occupied since Irene, has it? Uh, I, I don't know. Really so. And it is substantially damaged. Yeah. 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 You can you can just tell by seeing it. Um, I'll move to we'll approve the FEMA buyout request for 35 North Main. Second. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any questions? All right. That buyout is approved by the board. Can you carry this on top of the meeting, Get your buyouts while you can.
All right, next item is the Waterbury Dog Park. Mm -hmm. um, we were funding addressed by um, Forward uh, about two months ago, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, told us that uh, the Waterbury Dog Park's organization had essentially dissolved. Uh, they still had a couple thousand dollars in the account, and they're looking for the town to uh, come forward to help them uh, arrive at a solution. Uh, um, and to be clear that from what I've gathered, the board has, uh, essentially there's not a quorum of the board anymore. Mm -hmm. But the dog park is still being maintained by volunteers. It is a town park. Um, it is town park being the end. There's no requirement to have a dog park. But as long as volunteers are maintaining it, um, I think the desire is to keep it so the town would step up in the event that volunteers are not able to maintain it. Um, but Forward has a little bit of money available that the town, uh, by authorizing the screen, will be able to draw down as needed um, to recoup some of our expenses. Um, and the other piece is forward um, has the ability to accept funds, mm -hmm. um, which is another benefit for us. So people go to the dog park. There's the little, I believe, the little Venmo sign right there that you can mm -hmm. deposit funds directly into forward's account. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. Back to Spencer. And Karen Weston is here. And I didn't know until the other day, but Karen and her husband do a fair amount of maintenance. And Karen Ransom here does. All right, cool. Karen, uh, would you uh, like Karen to come forward and uh, just tell us what your involvement has been with the dog park? Both of you can come up at the same time. No. We're friends. <laughs> we, don't, we, we don't bite. You know, one chance of fame and fortune. <laughs> I think we're, we're sort of the last man standing. We weren't really ever part of the board or anything like that, but we were two volunteers and we hang out there a lot with our dogs. <coughs> so we feel like we should contribute to maintenance. And so um, between the two of us, we pretty much do the, the mowing and the revacking and whatever else needs to be done down there. But there are things that are happening that are sort of uh, above our pay grade, such as the giant tree that fell on the fence. So I, we would be more than happy for the town to sort of be nominally in charge of the park. I'm happy to keep mowing and doing whatever, but um, to have the immediate town or someone else that says us be in charge would be great. And I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch your name earlier. I didn't know the term. Kim Ransom. I have an overall question. <laughs> Maybe I'm out to lunch or whatnot, but I'm confused. The name of the organization is Friends for Waterbury Area Recreation Development. Does that group do anything other than the dog park or? Yes. Okay, that's what I thought. Tammy Bass is on. Okay. Tammy, could you answer that question? What else? Uh, yeah. I, I'm here. I'm the treasurer of Ford, and Lauren Landy, I see, is here as well. Lauren is the president. We have eight clients. Uh, we're fiscal agents to the dog park being one, the Waterbury Skate Park, Waterbury Arts, Waterbury Youth Soccer, the Grange Hall. Green Paths, Winterfest. I think I covered them all. Tennis? Excuse me? Tennis? Tennis? Is tennis still uh, part of forward? There really isn't any group no yeah, that has come to us. No. And just to clarify what Tom had said, forward uses uh, a third-party vendor called QGive. We don't use Venmo. Yeah. 
So is this memorandum of understanding just particular to the dog park? Or? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's where I was being. I, I knew Ford was involved in a bunch of other things, <laughs> yeah. but. I mean, that being said, don't be surprised if there's a conversation on the future board meeting where maybe this same funding mechanism, QGIV, is, is expanded at Hope Davy or other places where there could be some, mm -hmm. some okay. folks who want to give donations. Essentially, forward acts as a fiscal agent. A fiscal agent for all these different things. Registered organizations in town for supporting recreational activities. I just want to say one thing. When uh, a few months ago, a gentleman who was on the dog park board addressed the board and said, essentially, we're going away. Um, I've been wondering for a few months, and no one's been able to answer my question about who's actually maintaining the dog park. <laughs> our, our crew, our summer crew, kept going by there, and no one was yes. doing it. Normally, they were looking at him. You're, you're looking at him. Hey. Normally, Woody can answer that question in three seconds, but he couldn't. So thanks for doing the work for the last few months. We thank the you. Last few years. Um, a couple of years. <laughs> All right, so we have uh, a proposed uh, memorandum of understanding uh, on the of the dog park service. Mm -hmm. so we'll just do a little take out the whistle. Well, I'm just curious, Tom's perspective on this, in that, I mean, I guess it's not <coughs> negative in that, as we just discussed, there's utility of nonprofits doing it, I guess. We already own the land, and so <coughs> this is just essentially allowing the donation. Is that the purpose yeah. of, of the need for the MOU that they were coming? Just recognizing someone here could donate to the dog to the town for the dog park right now without this. They just mm -hmm. might not. Right, and, and this has been in place and existed for some years. I think people are used to it. Mm -hmm. You know, it could be that in three years we decide. It could be that there's no money at some point. Um, you know, you can always change that MOU. Okay. This doesn't talk about, to, to the best of my knowledge, the management. No, it's just about no, it's, it's just about the money. Yeah, okay, I just wanted to be sure I understood. There used to be a separate MOU. I remember when I did minutes for EFUD, there was a separate MOU between Waterbury Unleashed Dog Park and right. EFUD. Yeah. Which probably hasn't been looked at since excuse me, it would have been with the village, I think. Yeah. I think it was with EFUD, but it yeah. hasn't been looked at since we took over the copper, the town took over the copper. Sure, it hasn't. Yeah. 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 I think Natalie actually stopped me and asked me about that one then. Okay. This is Lauren Landy here. I was wondering if I could just chime in quickly. Um, I just wanted to make people aware that we do, um, so the MOU we have with all of our clients and um, it's pretty much the same MOU for each client. Um, and so one thing that I think we should be clear about is that we do charge a fee for our services. So we charge, I think it's on page, um, find it. page three, we charge 5% of whatever donations come in. That's our fee for managing um, the bank account and all the, in some of the overhead fees that we incur for being the nonprofit. Um, and the other thing I wanted to just call out is when we drafted this MOU, <clears throat> we were specifically talking about the um, dog park as being the focus. And now that we've changed the scope to include um, accepting donations for other uh, recreational parks in Waterbury. Um, um, no, we have not yet. I just, I just mentioned that might be something to talk about for the future. Oh, okay, perfect. So then if uh, that's not included in this scope, then, then I don't have anything to add for that part. Um, and I'll just clarify as well that the town will then get quarterly reports from forward in regard to um, balances, the, the checking account balances. And if there are any um, bills that need to get paid, 
um, I'll send the form over. A form just needs to be submitted to forward for disbursements or reimbursements. Karen, do you have, thanks, Tammy. Uh, Karen, do you have uh, any regular uh, expenses that would require uh, reimbursement? Occasionally, uh, we, one of us will buy a new set of poop scoopers or some other small items like that, um, gas for the mower. Mm -hmm. Nothing much, nothing mm -hmm. big. And generally, you know, something. it's just something that uh, we put in. Do or there are a few other people <laughs> that just sort of notice and buy new poop scoopers for any other things. So volunteers who just have kind of for the last few years just been doing that on their own. But, okay. Other questions from the board? That seems pretty straightforward. Thank you so much for, for stepping forward. We really appreciate uh, your value and uh, volunteer work to, to keep the value part going. Do you have a question? That's what we ask. Um, going forward, is, is the town um, able to do any mowing or maintenance down here on occasion? Okay. Like when they mow around the ice center? Yep, we just got to be in contact about it. Okay. And will they plow in the winter? We're, we're not going to really plow it out. We, it's our lot. We should be plowing the lot. I know the, once you know, in a while it does. The town, the, well, whoever plows just kind of swings around, but if they swung wide and plowed okay. where you park, that would be awesome. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> a little wider of a swing. Yeah. Yeah. So it does get uh, year round use? Yes, it does. Do I have a motion uh, to uh, authorize Tom to sign off on this memorandum of understanding? I make a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding as presented with the friends uh, with friends for Waterbury Area Recreation Development forward. I'll second. Moved and seconded. Further discussion. I would just like to thank you guys for doing it for the sake of doing it. That's yeah. great. Keep the poop down. Yes. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, thank you so much for coming forward and uh, good luck with the dog park. Next on the agenda amendment to ordinance regulating motor vehicle and traffic. 15-minute parking facility. Which page is that on, I, I never realized how big this ordinance is. It is in page section 10-10, yeah. yes. which in and of itself is three pages long. So if you find section 10-11, it's on the top of that page. Ten slash eleven. There we go. Article ten. So section forty-five details the fifteen-minute spots that are marked in town legally. What page? Wait, no, that's. So if you go to the very back and go four pages forward. Keep going, keep going. Yeah, two more pages. Yeah, is it? Which way is it? 1022. 1022. Is it 45? Right here. Oh, the top of the wall. And then go one more page. That's okay. That's okay. So you find painted spaces. I've read through this whole five. So that. Right I never realized how big this whole ordinance is. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> I didn't realize <laughs> every so stop sign. So detailed. Detailed. Got it I get you. I was, I was laughing. I was on the phone with Tom on Saturday or Sunday. I said, I didn't realize there's stop stop signs here and there. <laughs> on the west side of Stowe Street. So the background, the background was there was a request from 
Stones Throw Pizza to establish some 15 minute parking on Stowe Street. There is one existing spot at 5 Stowe Street, and so the thought was would the board be interested and willing to extend that further? For an additional one spot? For an additional spot. Um, did have a conversation with the owner about um, his parking situation and what's, what's happening is that um, the lot behind Stowe Street actually has three owners. First, the town has um, a number of spaces with the well lane and then there's a private company and then there's sorry then there's two private owners that own two different sections of the lot um, okay. which is not uncommon and I'm, and I'm sure if that you surveyed it you probably find some minor adjustments to the lines too which is not uncommon <laughs> um, you know the owner would like a dedicated pickup spot for his business mm -hmm. in the back and He's been unable to secure terms with the other parking lot owners, and, and we have public parking, and, and we don't have any situation in town where a business gets a dedicated spot for them. That's a whole different conversation, but I think considering a 15-minute space in the street might be a reasonable way to mm -hmm. help out, help his business succeed a little bit. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Isn't he getting I think on the street? <laughs> that was discussed. He didn't go forward with that. Oh, he didn't go Oh, OK. I think the 15 minute uh, spot is reasonable, but to have it dedicated, I because then where does it stop? You know, everyone's yeah, going to. I'm not suggesting dedicated. I'm just right. suggesting a, a general 15, 15 minutes. A general 15 minute, I have no problem with that to help businesses. Mm -hmm. So the dedicated spot right now is at 5 Stowe Street. Um, the. Do we own the lot next to um, Stowe Street Emporium? That, that small mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Part of it. Yeah, why don't we put it there? So, uh, There's no room for it there. There's no room for a parking spot. <coughs> but the next address up is 9 Stowe Street. You can put it on 9 Stowe Street and have them contiguous to each other. Can I ask, what, what do you mean there's no room for it at that, at that, <coughs> that lot? Little, um, that little, we own a little sliver of land near Stowe Street Emporium. Yeah. Um, I don't believe there's room for a parking spot on that piece of land. Oh, okay. No, I meant the... Are you talking about the parking lot behind uh, Stowe Street? No, I'm talking about the one in between Stowe Street Cafe and Bidwell Stowe Street. Lane. Yeah, yeah. Bidwell Lane. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Bidwell Lane. Yeah, yeah, the parking lot right there on Bidwell. Which is already, well, it's a different amendment because we already... That's carved up already. Two hour Stowe Street Cafe. Right, right. There's two hours. Yeah. Two hour There's so the well, No, no, no. Not on their side. On the Stowe Street oh, Emporium side. The Stowe Street. Would you like right. me to share the screen and show the map? Yes. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. I think that's an interesting idea, Kim. Yeah. yeah if, one of, if they're all two hour, why don't we make one 15 minutes? So let me just minimize this. But just to look at the existing. So 299 on this map. Um, 13 Stowe Street is where Stone Stowe is now. But this is town owned, and these lines oh. are reasonably accurate. Okay. Um. There are survey pins there that, that Bill Woodruff could locate if needed, if need be. So we own spaces there. There could be some way in the future to realign things a little better. Go up a little bit, right next to 297. But on the corner of Stowe Street and Bidwell, there's a little parking lot on the. Right here? Nope. In the shadow. In the shadow. In the shadow. That is a parking right lot. Yeah. That's what that's what I was referencing. Yeah. This one is handicapped. Right, but then why not make the second one 15 minutes? I think we have more information, but the present. Uh, uh, I'm reading our current <coughs> ordinance, and I, it just Google Maps all of them. Three Elm Street is mm -hmm. Craft Beer Collective. 34 South Main Street mm -hmm. is the bank. Five Stowe Street is a business. 27 South Main Street is sorry. 27 South Main Street is a credit union. 29 South Main Street is the bank. Um, there's one in front of Bargain Boutique. So, the, so I think there is a precedent for yeah. immediately in front of the business. And given that that's the request, oh. that's the reason I'm interested in honoring it on mm. Stowe Street. If the request was, 
for a take-in, take-out associated with a specific yeah, sure. business <coughs> as opposed to the general. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've also acknowledged that this request is from one business, the <coughs> a bagel business that's involved in an out 15-minute <laughs> thing in the vicinity, so mm -hmm. I don't. Uh, I, I'm just suggesting um, Stone's Throw is 13 Stowe Street, right? and it might be, it might be more convenient, more easy to decipher what's going on if you put the 15 minute space in front of nine Stowe Street. Yeah. So it's so the two yeah. are contiguous mm -hmm. yeah. rather than having a non 15 minute space in between. Yep. Yeah. Can I? Uh, yeah. Just so that five Stowe Street is that for Phoenix? Is that? <coughs> oh, is that the Phoenix? No, it used to be Axel's. Yeah. It was oh. Axel's. Axel's moved across the street. Right. But the parking space remains. So nine Stowe Street is WDEP and then Stowe Street. Right. Um, reading this and having Alyssa pointed out, that's a lot of 15 minute parking spots. Mm -hmm. I should have waited because I saw a sign today and I thought it was unauthorized, and it's in fact in the ordinance. So that was I reassuring. thought for years, I thought all of them are unauthorized. So <laughs> I, I guess my, my point being is there's no other, well, I guess, I mean, of course, Casey Bagel, but that current five Stowe Street is not associated with the business. Right? It used to be actually yeah, so associated no with a different business called yeah. Phoenix Gallery. Oh, yeah. right. And they've requested a 15 minute parking. I don't really. Mm -hmm. that, no, that no. was in the ordinance this previously. Is, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. We, can, we can move this one. Just oh, we can move the one that already exists up a space? Right. It's closer to. I like that, I like that compromise. 213? Huh? I don't know. Because. If Phoenix, uh, if anyone's been in touch with Phoenix, but uh, I can imagine that 15 minutes makes much of a difference to them. I don't think so either. <laughs> well, so we're speaking about them being allocated in terms of businesses, and candidly, Whitney at the time advocated strong in the creation yeah. of that parking spot, so that's like public record. So, but. I guess that's what I'm torn between is the like logistical location, which we're acknowledging is often in front of businesses. And right. it, it, I think the reflection was it's a community asset. It's not like everyone gets their own handicap parking spaces. We have several in the mix for well, the community. Is there concern against two? I guess like in my view, there's a there's the proposal to add one additional 15 minute parking spot at 9 Stowe Street as proposed by Tom. Mm -hmm. Or I, I, I think we've established that parking is tough on Stowe Street. Well, all I would say is, is yes, yes, Whitney argued for it because her business was there, but now that her business is no longer there, we could just take the spot and move it to the business that wants it now. I guess, but we also heard that was one where we actually had a feedback loop of then Whitney coming back and saying, I advocated for this and I wanted to let you know it's used frequently for folks picking up and dropping off, oh, which oh. was part of the thing by folks bopping in and out. I mean, that was the whole point of asking for it was that it's challenging if folks are doing quick drop offs and delivery and can't find parking. And so it is now across the street. I'm sure that's less optimal, but I, I don't know that it's not serving its purpose. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. And not I. So. I'm happy to make a motion that we amend the parking ordinance to include uh, additional 15 minute parking space located at the Street. Second. Great. Second. Seconded. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. That will be added to the ordinance. And just for process, that's He's got to get the sign in. <laughs> right, I, I just mean in terms of like if and when we needed to adjust this ordinance yeah. again. Because I'm not well, we don't have any permanent signage at any of these locations, do we? There's one in front of our yeah. That's why I noticed. Oh, it's today, a permanent. It's yeah. like oh, it was portable, yeah. so it's like on the sidewalk, oh, oh, on the stand. The, the one for the credit union is permanent. Is permanent. Is permanent. Mm. It's signed. Mm -hmm. I think we should have a simplification of. It. <laughs> it's pretty robust. I've never seen such. This is, yes, <laughs> all about parking. This is, <laughs> this is a very, that. very typical mm -hmm. town traffic ordinance. Pretty great. Right. I also liked how 
green lights were determined <laughs> in here. That was oh, my yeah. favorite. <laughs> yeah. That was my what favorite did you? A blinking yellow? Ah. ah. And then I just also sent that quick email as food for thought about the parking ban. And oh, yeah. That's all right. Once we get through the winter, that should be revisited just yeah. based on weather. Uh -huh. well, there's snow still hanging yeah. around at the end of March. And, or would you or there's no snow in November. Yeah. Or any of the I know communities that have just transferred from instead of a blanket season doing, I know Burlington has a like if the lights are on parking ban that night, but otherwise you don't have to assume it's in effect. Yeah. Um, which would be a management question around what public works wants or doesn't want. We could have all the street lights blink in Morse code. <laughs> <laughs> You're bad. <laughs> But yeah, Stowe on the Street. bridge, on the Stowe Street Bridge, yeah, they all blink in different intervals. It's great. <laughs> Functionally, I believe only toes when uh, there is a snow emergency and they need to plow and someone has left their car there uh, past midnight. Yeah, and even then we'll we have occasional exceptions and people call and have car legitimate shock. need. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. My older son did not take that, for, especially in the <laughs> <laughs> no, no using my son's anymore, <laughs> examples. Um, so, uh, let's uh, look at uh, the next meeting agenda. Can I ask a question? Yep. question? Sorry, real quick about that ordinance. Do I yeah. need to rewrite it, include that, bring it back in two weeks, have them sign it? When does the clock start ticking? The ordinance? Yeah. Um, sorry, say it again. Do you need to rewrite it? Do I need to add that 15 minute parking spot, and then there's the. <laughs> Uh, this one on our website, they never signed. <laughs> yeah, we should have them sign it. Okay. We'll add that and have them sign it. The, the, the 30 day clock has started ticking already. Okay, so I'll, I'll publish it in the paper and do all that. Okay, so I'll draft it and maybe as you're all stopping by, at least if I get three of you to sign it, so it's uh, a memorial. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. So I'll just have that at my desk. So we're going to do another <laughs> amendment for winter parking ban? No, we're looking at. No. The Perhaps no. next year we'll Next year, okay. Just and Karen, yeah. we can just add 9 Stowe Street here and not add a line, so they can okay. sign it here. Oh, okay, I have a... Just and a then box. just, just, the, just the last page, and I'm sure the rest of it we can keep the well, same. Well, but this says amended on the 5th day of August 2020. Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll just have to make one that's clean. Well, we'll, we'll stop. Yeah. Speaking of which, has anyone seen the um, warrants? Yes. I signed them. Oh, okay. I signed them good. I yeah. saved me a trip tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, so for uh, the next uh, meeting will be on December 2nd. <coughs> um, and we've got the consent agenda and uh, the Woody Avenue outreach. And the 530 board of Oh, the 530 board of payment. Right. Uh, hearing. In our first review of the one abatement or more? I have two now. Two? Um, okay. Yeah, well, I guess we can stick with 530 now. Yeah. Um, and so then, um, any, and then uh, we're going to try to get uh, through uh, a budget uh, by the end of uh, December, which is going to require meetings every Monday night uh, through December, maybe with the so when you say first review of 2025, is that the overall budget or any of the... I'll give you the whole package. The whole <laughs> shebang, okay. Uh, Christmas is a Wednesday, so yeah. we're in the clear. All right. So, so it's a Monday, December 2nd. We're getting the whole budget. Christmas. <laughs> we're going to do the whole thing. <laughs> Monday we'll night. plan on having special meetings done on the 9th, uh, the 23rd, and the 30th. As Happy holidays. Uh, hi, this is Amy. I just have a quick question from, um, do you have a schedule of similar to what we experienced with the Planning Commission in terms of inputs that you would need from specifically the Conservation Commission, but perhaps the other stakeholders do? ASAP. <laughs> Well, I think we should amend. It should be first review of 2025 budget and schedule. I mean, if you want things before that. But yes. I assume you're penciling in. I think, you know. Well, yeah. I, I guess I asked for schedule anyway in that we it could be a separate agenda item or part mm -hmm. of that. But we, I think we want to 
have the outline of what the town meeting process is going to be uh -huh. in December, just to talk about it. Assuming right. that like we're working through December to get a final budget by January for community input in January. Right. Um, so that sounds like a next agenda. A second agenda, agenda item. Yeah. Um, Twenty twenty five budget and annual meeting schedule. I know this is not entirely answering Amy's question, but that was my request on this item. Uh, no, it's helpful. Thank you. Um, and then, yeah, Tom, you'll reach out individually to the people you need for the draft. So, uh, Tom, are you looking for input before uh, December second? From uh, the likes of the yeah. uh, conservation. Yeah, Commission. and I've, I've already reached out to a lot of folks. Uh, one other issue just occurred to me, and I forget the ruling that was made, but there was. It was Mike's motion. I forget this. Something related to the entities that get funding. Special yes. article. Special oh, article. Special article. If, they did not, if they did not invoice us, oh, right. we would still pay them because we have to, but they would go back. I think you said, did you say you'd make them petition? Make them re-petition. Make them re-petition to get on the agenda. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me put that on. Okay. Well, I thought we already approved it. As I recall, it was, it was, it was, yeah. it was approved. Department. It was approved, so I don't think it has to be on the yeah. agenda. I think it was just a kind of a change in policy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right. We wanted to give you clarity around the expectations of when folks were notified and then have a policy to point people to. If right. They had and it may be good in uh, if you send a notice to them, say, <coughs> if if you fail to, you know, we will ask you to re-petition us for future requests. Then I may need an agenda item um, for ARPA. I'm not sure I'll need it, but I just like the placeholder. All ARPA funds have to be allocated by the yep. end of this year, and they they all are allocated except yeah, I thought we allocated. One of the bridges, the Guptill Road Bridge, that was done with ARPA funds. I'm, I'm waiting on the final invoice. It's a rare case where we're pestering the vendor to bill us. I, if that bill is under, we have, out, we have ARPA funds to reallocate. So it wouldn't be a bad problem to have. Um, just been pestering that vendor for the invoice for a couple months. Now. Another pancake breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure that'll qualify. I don't think <laughs> What is the, what do they charge the Pentagon for stuff like Purell hints? Five hundred dollars for Purell. Yeah. <laughs> Other yep. Um, decided to meet between no they will be combining their November and December meeting on December 9th so that would be later in December then that we would meet with them yeah do they meet here yes we'll, they do well it's going to be a conflict then no it won't no, they, they meet at, they meet at 5 30 what they meet, they meet earlier. Oh, earlier okay so but if you if you feel like barging in <laughs> be my guest um, do you want to pencil that in Yes. Yeah. yeah. So Definitely. The, the other piece, I did provide them my comments on their uh, handbook. Yeah, I saw that. And I, I did provide um, John Malter and I know Kane and Roger, I think a few others, the draft job description for the natural disaster coordinator. Um, but that would need to be approved by the select board mm -hmm. at some point. We could probably kill two birds with one stone. Yeah, Wouldn't that just be in the yeah. annual budget or so? Yeah, but the position's got to be created. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do we have postcards for rental registry for December 2nd? I don't know what the agenda item should be. Uh, just, you just wanted final approval of the language. Yeah. Postcard for the uh, uh, rental registry. registry. I mean, just like, yeah, outreach for rental registry. Anything else? 
else for uh, December 2nd agenda. All right then, let's move on. Uh, I believe we do, we will have an executive session tonight. Theme? Personnel. Personnel. Let me see if I can do it. Let's see if I can do it from memory. Sure. I bet I can. Hold on. I got I to think about it. I, what? I said just invite the municipal manager. Uh, I move to find. We don't have to, it's not real estate. You can just say it's personal. Oh. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, isn't it the same intro? No. Because we don't have to do I make up facts. That personnel is confidential. That was just confidential. Oh, so, so it's just. We, uh, yes. One could move to enter executive session for the discussion of. Personnel matters and invite the municipal All right, I move to enter executive session to discuss personnel matters and I invite the municipal manager. Second. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any All right. Okay, at uh, 10.02, we have entered executive session and I'll uh, reconvene this meeting with the Waterbury Select Board on the 18th of November. 2024, and uh, we are on the uh, added motion uh, agenda item of discussing uh, the employees' uh, health care plan for 2025. Do we have a motion? Second. Go ahead. Bye. I don't feel like the rest. I just acknowledge that we made a decision on this around a very significant change in the healthcare plan and recognize that it has really enormous impact for employees and that it was a really compressed timeline. So in response to that, in attempting to try and soften the transition, um, I move that we allocate contributions equal to half of the employees deductible in HSA payments to be paid quarterly for all employees who uh, elect to take town and health insurance beginning January 1 of 2025. Second that. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? Half deductibles of the policy that you're telling us we have to have? Correct. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'll add that uh, we recognize that this is a, a significant change. Uh, the other significant change is that rate increases are escalating at up to 23%, and that this is one of the things that's driving uh, the accelerated educational taxes in the state, uh, and that uh, as a town, we feel like uh, we cannot uh, afford to continue to absorb that. And so we had to make uh, what we consider a tough decision, but we think it's the right one. Is that discussion? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I agree okay. Uh, no further discussion? All good to say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, we have completed the business uh, at hand. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board. Do I have a second? Second. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Aye. 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 Aye.